There's magic coming out of my fingers. I can feel it. I can feel it. Morning, this is Ian Lee, BBC Three Counties Radio. We've got a lot to talk about this morning, including complaints about Milton Keynes Hospital. Complaints about Bedfordshire Police. Complaints about the education system. Complaints about the people I work with. That's just from me. But also, it's not all complaints. No, because today I've decided we are giving away dead rock stars. Yes, we're giving them away. We're giving them away. I'm having George Harrison. He's mine. No one else can touch. Can I have Mama Cass, please? Yo, you're straight in with the Mama Cass. Kelly Betts? Uh, Dusty Springfield. Oh, oh, oh. three of the good ones have gone already. And we're not even five minutes into the show. Who do you want? Phone up, claim them, they're yours. You don't actually physically get anything, let's make that clear. We are the BBC, for goodness sakes. But you get bragging rights. Every time a record that comes on by, say, Nirvana, you can go, oh, that Kurt Cobain, yeah, he's mine. Facebook.com forward slash BBC 3CR. You can send me a text, 81333, start your text 3CR. Or, if you want to play proper, 08459 455 555. Across beds, hearts and bucks. This is BBC Three Counties Radio. Hey, i tell you something. Kelly, you know that uh, George Harrison? Yeah. He's mine. Morning, this is Ian Lee, BBC Three Counties Radio. We've all had a sniff this morning of the posh coffee. That's why it could be a little bit perkier than usual. Oh eight four five nine four double five five double five is the phone number. Now, if you were listening yesterday, you'll have heard allegations that two Luton police officers assaulted a man called Farouk Ali, who has a very severe form of autism. We spoke to Farouk's brother, who told us his condition means that he likes and needs routine. One of those routines is watching the bin collection every week. So when the police told him to move along and then tried to compel him to do so, things got physical, and uh, Farouk's brother claimed that Farouk was uh, pushed and punched. Well, it's caused a huge amount of tension in the area where he lives which is why his family called a public meeting last night. The police commissioner and deputy chief constable was there as was our reporter Matt Lockwood Matt this was designed I think to kind of calm things down didn't quite pan out like that did it? No it didn't. There was an atmosphere of deep anger and frustration people were standing outside the hall was packed and the police were constantly shouted down as they tried to answer questions. This is a flavour of how heated it got. You've had enough, Dave. You've had well, enough. I'd have to sit here and listen to you murdering people okay. every time. Bullying people. You know, cover up. You know what I'm saying? All the same, mate. Back time, the community's got together. Yeah. That's what yeah. this is about. Yeah. 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 Can I please yeah. request you? real. Um, Don't let me fool you! Fools, mate. The name of Leon Briggs, who died in police custody, was being mentioned repeatedly. During the meeting, there were calls for the immediate suspension of the police officers involved. Why did your brother mention the fact that we were going to put an alert on our system? Actually, what we did... Why didn't we suspend it? Why didn't we suspend it? Why didn't we suspend it? suspend it? The police and crime commissioner, Ollie Martins, was asked if the police officers should have been suspended. There was no answer. He didn't reply? No, he didn't. What did the police have to say at last night's meeting when they, when they could get a word in? Well, they admitted that something had gone wrong in Whitby Road. They confirmed that the officers involved were traffic cops carrying out a routine patrol. The Deputy Chief Constable Nigel Trippett told Farouk Ali, or said Farouk Ali, was vulnerable and that had instigated their contact. He couldn't elaborate beyond that point. He also said that the incident was not reported immediately by the officers, but a while afterwards. Some people will find that uh, slightly shocking. If, if, if claims of a gentleman uh, uh, being punched, as Farouk's brother said, it took a while for the officers to report that. Is there any more news on the investigation launched by Bedfordshire Police? Well, we found out that the officers at the centre of these allegations have yet to be interviewed over what happened nearly uh, two weeks on, uh, but they have been prevented from carrying out any more patrols in Luton while the investigation is ongoing. Uh, witness statements have not yet been collected, and the Deputy Chief Constable Nigel Trippett couldn't put a time limit on the investigation. I'm not going to go into the details of the um, uh, of the uh, case. It would be inappropriate. All I can say is that you know we deal with vulnerable, um, a large number of vulnerable people on a daily basis. The majority of those interactions go without 
use of force without complaint and without recourse you know on a, odd occasions we get things wrong or circumstances um, beyond our control go wrong which have, have us um, looking at ourselves reviewing what's happened in order that we can improve the way we deliver services to the people of Bedfordshire. Well I know later on Matt that we'll be speaking to uh, Ollie Martins uh, Bedfordshire P- Constabulary Police and Crime Commissioner and also Jim Saunders Chief Superintendent I, I, and I will put those points to him that uh, two weeks after the events happened the officers at the centre of these allegations haven't been interviewed and witness state- statements haven't been collected. That seems uh, um, surprising to me. Farouk's family, were they satisfied with the outcome of last night's meeting? Quite simply, they weren't. The brother of Farouk, Dobia, who you spoke to yesterday, mm. told me the meeting was pointless. There was also frustration that the deputy, that the chief constable, Colette Paul, wasn't there, and she had another engagement, apparently. And Farouk's sister, Hassan Begum, uh, told me that the police can't be trusted to carry out an impartial investigation. And like you said, like you said you'll be speaking to uh, Farouk's brother later and Bez Police. Matt, thank you very much indeed. Uh, th- th- yes, and I will be putting those, po- those uh, surprising points, the two weeks after the incident, the officers at the centre of the allegations have yet to be interviewed and witness statements have not been collected. 08459 four double five five double five. Morning, this is Ian Lee, BBC Three Counties Radio. You can have your say on the police. We took some calls yesterday about the police. You can certainly have your say on that. We're also giving away dead rock stars. I've got George Harrison, Catherine's got Mama Cass, uh, and Kelly's got Dusty Springfield. We'd, we've already... Uh, J- Jimi Hendrix has been claimed, I'm afraid, already, by uh, Jim from Langford. He has got Jimi Hendrix, so uh, he's gone. Who do you want? 08459 four double five five double five. We're giving away uh, dead rock stars. Ryan is near the Black Cat Roundabout in Milton Keynes. Morning, Ryan. Morning. Who would you like to claim, sir? Now, bearing in mind, if you if you get this person, you have to look after their name and protect it for the rest of your life, but you can pass it on to your children if you so desire. Well, I'm having the king, the man, Elvis Presley. Elvis Presley. He's, he's yours. What, what will you do with owning Elvis Presley? How will you utilise him? Well, I don't think I'll do much more than my mother and have him all over the house. She's had Elvis all over the house. Pretty much. Wow, what a what a what a, a, a swinging mum you got there, Ryan. He's yours. So so far, Hendrix has gone, Cass has gone, Dusty has gone, Elvis has gone. Oh, speaking of Cass, she's yours. She is. Do you, do you want to uh, introduce the next song? Here's my mama, Cass. Man alive! What a song. So proud of her. Isn't she good? Well she done. Is, she is. What a voice. I've got I've got to make you a mama Cass mixtape because I've got some cracking stuff. I will bring that in. Sorry. That's illegal, isn't it? Um, uh, I, I've a mental a, one. I, I will write down some uh, records that you should go out and purchase yourself, Catherine Boyle. Now listen, the reason we got you in, something very serious, the health watchdog has stepped in to defend a woman whose complaints about her treatment at Milton Keynes Hospital got her banned, banned from the hospital. The patient sent dozens of emails and just as many phone calls throughout April and May last year. Well, Catherine, you've been looking into this. What yeah. did this lady do to end up being banned from the hospital? I find that incredible. Well, she complained about her treatment at the hospital and you're going to speak to her in about an hour's time so you can get it straight from the horse's mouth. But she's asked us not to name her. She was unhappy with her treatment and submitted a series of complaints by email and phone call. These reached such a level that the hospital wrote to her saying that the level of contact between her and it had become untenable. At that stage, she was asked to put the concerns into one complaint and allow the hospital trust to investigate. But by April that year, the situation hadn't gone any better and she was told her complaints were impacting on the ability of staff to carry out their work. Um, Then she received a letter from the hospital's chief operating officer, Darren Leach, saying she was no longer allowed to attend Milton Keynes Hospital unless she required urgent treatment and had a pre-arranged appointment or was attending as an inpatient or for a meeting previously arranged in writing. So some quite strict limits on the amount of contact she would have in person. Okay, so how much was was she complaining to cause this ban then? Well, the hospital released figures to show that in a little over a month um, during April and May 2013, she sent 35 emails, made 56 phone calls to them. There was then a warning from a matron uh, saying staff had been told not to communicate with the complainant other than in relation to a complaint. There then came a further 21 emails and six phone calls made to the hospital between then and the end of June last year. OK, well, why did she send so many emails? She says that the number of emails stacked up because she wasn't receiving replies or even acknowledgements to her complaints and inquiries. Also, she said that many of the phone calls recorded by the hospital weren't actually answered. Mm. So there were attempted phone calls. So five attempts to get through to the hospital would count as five phone calls, even though she only received an answer once. <laughs> Uh, I can understand how that could be mildly frustrating for for hospital staff, but she got banned for that. Well, 
It was worse than that because within Mr. Leach's letter, and we talked about Mr. Leach earlier, Darren Leach, who was the chief operating officer, he suggested that part of his role was to protect staff from violent and abusive behaviour, which he took exception to. The letter was copied to the lady's doctor, her consultants in London, and the ambulance service. Indeed, when she contacted the ambulance service to talk to them about it, she told her that because of the use of the word violent, a police escort might be required if she ever had to be taken to hospital. That can't be right. Can it? Well, that's what the uh, health service ombudsman thought last week. He upheld a complaint from this uh, this person, which was made shortly after she received um, the letter from Mr. Leach. In the ombudsman response, they said that they'd seen no evidence that the hospital had taken any other measures to resolve this problem. And the author, Katie McKinley, said she couldn't understand why a problem of unreasonable levels of correspondence should result in a ban on access to the hospital. She agreed the hospital shouldn't have implied that the patient was violent and abusive, saying that this was the result of using one of those of standard letter forms. And in conclusion, the ombudsman upheld the complaint and said the hospital had been correct to try to manage contact between themselves and the complainant, but the action they took was inappropriate. Um, The hospital's been ordered to lift its restrictions and to write to the other medical authorities involved in this, telling them of their mistake. What has the hospital said about this? We were hoping to speak to them this morning. Um, In fact, we contacted them to ask whether the hospital's chief executive, Joe Harrison, or anyone else from the hospital would like to come on and talk to us about this on the programme, but they've declined. I bet they did. They also have um, declined to send us a statement. So that's disappointing. Not even as a yet, statement. nothing at all. Well, that's disappointing. We're speaking to the lady a little bit later on, aren't we? Yeah, we are. Okay, thank you very much for that. Across beds, hearts, and bugs. This is Ian Lee, BBC Three Counties Radio. Right, I'm going to I'm going to play a song from a compact disc. I'm going to play a song. Do you remember compact discs, Kelly? Compact discs. Um, compact discs. It's like like, like small. What, rep- they, what they? What were they? Something called something for short. Uh, they comp, were uh, comp, comp. comps. Comps. They're like small records. Yeah. And I'm I've, I've, I'm really going through a, a McCartney solo phase at the moment. I'm experimenting with McCartneyism. I feel like you need to lay off the McCartney. No way. No way. No way. Can't lay off the you McCartney. You need to quit McCartney. No way, man. I can't. I can't do it. Uh, and I listened to Flowers in the Dirt the other week. Very poor album. There are, there's one really good song, My Brave Face. Half decent song, put it there, which actually is quite a nice song. Um, this one is quite nice, but that's mm. it, the rest is guff. But then I got this album, Memory Almost Full, mm. from 2007. A 2007 Paul McCartney solo album? That shouldn't work. It does. It's a masterpiece. Do you want to hear a track from it? Say Where yes. did it chart? That's, I mean, if you're just going to judge success by the number of people that buy it, then aren't yeah. you shallow? Yeah, you're right. Do you want to hear a song from it? Okay. Say it, yes. It, yes. That is a great song. When I was a kid. No, I heard Catherine, you just made me laugh. What did you say over the intercom to me? Well, like the yodeling. <laughs> I knew you'd hate that record. I knew you'd I hate, hate it. I hate it. You pulled... You're, do, you're pulling the face now. You're pulling, <laughs> you're pulling the I hate it face, but I don't want to slag off Paul McCartney because we're the BBC and we've got our tongues no, 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 right no, up would, his bass guitar. No, I, no I, I wouldn't hesitate if I felt it was merited, but it, I, th- I thought it was quite good. Uh, <laughs> oh, you're so cheeky. It's an excellent record. Memory almost full. I can't take it out of my car CD player. No, I literally can't. The car CD player's broken. Across beds, hearts and bugs. This is Ian Lee. BBC Three Counties Radio. I I have to... uh, It's very rarely I do this, and this isn't just because contracts are coming up for renewal. I have to thank my boss, Lawrence Colhane, this morning. Oh, really? What's he done now? He's just a really great guy. No, because... (laughs) No, no, he is... I I mean, he is a great guy, but that's not what I'm thanking him for. My little boy at night times is becoming a little so and so. He really is pushing. Do the voice. I want to be no, in the no, no. story. You know what we want. Which voice? With the echo. <laughs> oh, you want that? He does sound like when he gets angry, he sounds like he's in uh, The Exorcist. I want to be in that story. <laughs> you, I will not love you anymore. That's what, that's what he was saying last night. He, and he knows that the word stupid is banned. And fair play to him, he's really trying not to say stupid. He goes, you're s- s- silly. <laughs> although, although last night I heard him going, you're s- sh- y- 
stupid. <laughs> <laughs> Thinking that's not the word. I could put the letters together. It's a stupid. You know, since hanging about with you uh, last weekend, my yeah. two-year-old is now calling things stupid. Ooh, not people. Hey. She told me that Show Me Show Me was stupid so, Whoa, it sounds like you're angling for a court case. You're not getting admission from me. Yeah. I don't love you anymore, and I'm not going to play with you ever again. That was his threat last night. That was his threat. I was like, all right, I'm, I'm 40. What are you on about, son? Anyway, anyway, he was having a stop last night and I was dealing with it. By, I said to him, I set it up in advance. If you carry on that behaviour tonight, I'm just going to stop. I'm just going to ignore you. I'm just going to ignore you and uh, we won't have any stop. He carried on behaviour, so I just sat there and ignored him. You're s- s- silly. But then, and he, he kind of calmed down. I, I, I threw him a curveball. This one for about 15 minutes. And I said, um, do you want to hear a song about a man being eaten by a snake? Yeah. Straight away, he's gone, from, he's gone from "I hate you" to "Yeah," and he said, "And this was a song that Lawrence recommended. Who is it? Peter, Paul, and Mary." Yeah, it's brilliant. It's brilliant. It's written by written by Shul Silverstein, who's who's a brilliant writer. I didn't realise it was him. And it's this minute and a half. I haven't got it, so I can't play it now. We'll oh, get. I might have it. Have you got it? Can you get it? Because it's brilliant. It's a brilliant song, Kelly. Right? It's great. It's a minute and a half long, and I couldn't find the Peter, Paul, and Mary version. Okay, so I had to go on the YouTube, and. Um, well, the only version I could find was Johnny Cash. So I'm there with my boy, watching Johnny Cash singing a weird song about being eaten by a snake. And it's brilliant. And he was in his... First, first time round, he's going, what? That's really odd. Second time round, he's wetting himself. He's in hysterics. I've got to thank Lawrence, because it was, it, was, it was... I threw him a curveball, and the boy responded to it with, uh, with laughter, and it, it totally diffused the situation. Are you hunting for it on... Uh, I've got it here. I've got the Shel Silverstein version. I want to hear it. Have you, got, have you got the Peter, Paul and Mary version? I might have it in my... Yeah, hang on. Because that version, I think... I, 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 I'm not quite sure what Shell's singing voice is up, was up to. He's a brilliant songwriter. He wrote lots of songs for Dr. Hook, including Sylvia's mother. He, oh. He, he was a very clever... Uh, the, 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 I might do, I, I'm thinking there's, there's a book in Shel Silverstein somewhere. He was a very clever sort of uh, satirical songwriter who would do these bits and pieces. Uh, you can give us a call this morning with, with songs that trick your children. Let's do that. <laughs> songs that trick your children, that can turn a mood around within a second and uh, just uh, have he was in hysterics and then we watched the monkeys videos and he was uh, look at them daddy they're, they're running into each other they're so silly it made my heart it made my heart melt how are we doing Catherine we got it uh, you might want to play something else I'll right? tell you what we'll do I'll tell you because we're giving away dead rock stars this morning I've had mine George Harrison you've had yours the wonderful mama Cass Kelly remind uh, uh, us and the listeners who it is that you own I have gone for the wonderful voiced Dusty Springfield <laughs> She's yours. Thanks. Sorry? I... There we go. There we go. Kelly Betts, you've chosen well. Some uh, people will be surprised that someone so young, you're only 13 years old, you, you're even aware of who Dustin Springfield is. Yes, I am. Oh, hello. Hello. Hi, I'm Hi there. here. Yes, I am. Of course I am. Yes, I am. Of, of course, course I, I am. am. I yes, I am. a dusty hit. <laughs> now, we've, Catherine, you, you've managed to find the song, did you? I think so. Let's just hope it works. Let's just have a little look. If I, if I put that over gay adoption there. and uh, Okay, right. So this is the song that uh, my little boy was going bonkers. I threw him the curveball off. Do you want to hear a song about someone getting eaten by a snake? Yeah. I'm being swallowed by a boa constrictor. I'm being swallowed by a boa constrictor. I'm being swallowed by a boa constrictor. And I don't like it very much. Oh, no. Oh, no. He swallowed my toe. He swallowed my toe. Oh, gee. Oh, gee. He's up to my knee. He's up to my knee. Oh, fiddle. Oh, fiddle. He's reached my middle. He's reached my middle. Oh, heck. Fantastic. Now, come on, that. Listen, you cold plays, your Lady Gagas. That's what a song should be, isn't it? Did your girls like it? They loved it. It's a short, sharp shock song, oh, it, isn't it? it? It's brilliant. And then, then we got into... Oh, we watched this... Well, the Johnny Cash version is very bizarre. We watched that about uh, 12 times on YouTube. And then we're in bed. I finally, finally managed to get the, the, my son in bed. And we're singing it in bed. It was brilliant. Is it, did you like that, Kelly? 
I did. There we go, you see. Thank you to Lawrence for, uh, for that, and I hope that your children will be as entertained as mine were. Right, what have you got in the papers? There's um, lots in the papers there's today. There's going on about a uh, retired cricketer and a uh, reality TV star. The Independent thinks it's more important to talk about Crimea. Oh, wow. Priorities. Uh, new way to fight agony of arthritis, says the Daily Express. Another cure there, so uh, that's on, sorted. Can I stop you the, for... Yeah? You're, you're doing the front pages. Yeah, but I'm, then I'm going to dip in, because I've got well, the story about cabbies well, being no. told not to... Um, well, no, because I do the front pages. I don't know if you listen to the show. I do the front pages a bit later on when well, yeah, one of the guests you've set up drop out. Yeah. So... Just, that's kind of my t- it's kind of my territory and I kind of like it if you uh, got out of my garden and she closed the gate behind you what's inside the papers Catherine cabbies have been banned from having sex with their passengers after one was caught what? in the what what that's the, not fair the driver romped how can you romp in the back of a taxi there I'd- surely has to be some bounding for rompage well, she's acting out a romp here, dear listener. You she's can't acting... romp in the back of a taxi. You're in a restricted space. There are kids now in cars on the way to school or whatever saying to their mums and dads, Mum, what's a romp? Well, I'll tell you what, kids. It's this. They... Y- y- th- yes. That's a horse. I saw gambling yes, uh, around the gosh. studio. Are you heavy-footed? Very... Well, I was doing it for the, um, priv- you know, the, uh, the ears of the listener. Well, so you can hear I'm, me romping. And I'm sure the listener enjoyed having their ears abused in that way. <laughs> So, because we often hear this, and if you're a cabbie, give us a call with this, because uh, uh, obviously bearing in mind we have young ears listening. So, I, I have spoken to so many cabbies, and you say, is it true that, you, you know, quite often you'll get young ladies offering you romps because they can't afford it? I think that 98% of cabbies have, have at least been offered something instead of payment. Do you need a rule? to tell you that it's not a good idea, really. And are you going to listen to a rule? Mm. The the suspended teacher, page seven, it's in all the papers, I think. Suspended teacher who sellotaped shut mouths of giggling (gasps) ten-year-olds. A primary school teacher has been suspended for sellotaping over the mouths of her ten-year-old pupils after they refused to stop giggling and talking. Can I just say, ten-year-olds are supposed to giggle, aren't they? Well, but it was an art lesson, for goodness sakes. Serious stuff. Parents said that when some children ripped off the tape because they were struggling to breathe, the Spanish born teacher oh here we go replaced it other children were left with bleeding lips when the tape was removed and several said they were scared about returning to school now there will be people listening to this going good on her good that's what we need a good bit of spanish discipline to highlight the uh, picture uh, the story they have uh, a picture of uh, thomas bradbury who's one of the pupils holding up some sellotape and looking sad they still do those pictures. I thought that that was... <laughs> wow. Uh, uh, obviously, obviously, it's wrong. But there will be... If you think it was a, it was a good idea, 08459 four double five five double five. And if you, like me, have ever taped your lips together for hmm. ridiculous reasons, you will know that's not a good idea. Why would you do that? Why did you tape your lips together? Oh, just for fun. I, uh, yeah. Well, I can't remember why. Were you romping? <laughs> No, I can't remember why I did it. I just did it and took half my lip off trying to get it off. So don't do that, kids. It's silly. You got, it's anything, sh- you got anything else before we speak to Alice Glossop? And um, there's an owl who's afraid of going outside, so he stays in. A boy five buys a three and a half thousand pounds bin truck. There are s- several things amazing to this story. Little William Bateman is so fascinated by rubbish collection, he bought a full size bin lorry using his mum's credit card. What? The five year old went on her computer and bid three and a half thousand pounds on eBay. She was horrified to discover he'd won the online auction. So he's, it, it doesn't say how old he is. Oh, he's five. So he's five, he's gone on eBay, he's bought, he bought it. That's shocking, okay? What's more shocking is, I didn't know you could buy... It's a proper council bin collection, rubbish collection mm-hmm. thing. With a crusher in that. With a crusher in that. It's only only £3,500 on eBay. I'm so sorely tempted. I'm really genuinely tempted. Wouldn't that be awesome if I drove into work in a, in a rubbish bin You live collector? in a very snooty area. They yeah. already think you're bringing the tone down. Well, you say that. Someone opposite the, the, the street, uh, the, the house opposite me, had, had left outside this house two uh, little, little bags, which I could only assume are full of dog poop. What? Why would anyone do that? If you're going to take the time to, to bend down and put it in a bag, then take it home with you. The scumbags. That's oh. nothing. They end up in the trees where I live. Oh, they, sometimes they hang it from trees, don't like they? like Christmas. I'm Alice Gloss at BBC Three Counties Radio. Alice, I'm not going to put you on the spot now, but this morning we are giving away dead rock stars. I'll speak to you maybe in half an hour if you could have a little think of who you'd like to claim. I've got George Harrison, so hands off, OK? Giving away? We're giving them away. They're yours. Not the actual physical oh, okay. remains. That would be inappropriate. <laughs> have a think who you'd like to claim, and I'll speak to you at sure. quarter past seven. Sure thing. Just what it is. 
That surprised her, didn't it? It's 6.46. Uh, this is Inley, BBC Three Counties Radio. Catherine has joined me in the studio to go through the papers. Lots of stories. You found a cracking one in a second. Before that, uh, we were talking about the boy that uh, bought a three and a half thousand... Um, what would you call it? Um, a bin car, a bin lorry. A bin lorry. Yeah. Like the council drive around yeah. on Tuesdays. In my a crusher. Area. Yeah, what, what day is it in yours? Tuesday. Tuesday? Yeah, yesterday. Isn't that coincidence? Yeah. Right, Tuesday. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Trevor's in Hemel. Morning, Trevor. Morning. What, what would you like to say? Um, talking about the credit cards. Yeah. My little boy done the same thing, but he couldn't work out the freezer ditch security cards. So, <gasps> so, so he was actively, he had the card in front of him and was typing yeah. in the numbers. He put in the full number, he put in the expiry date, and this, it was the security card that stumped him. He could work out the three digits. How old is he? Five. Oh, man, that's what, terrifying. What was he buying, Trevor? He was on a, a gaming website to download games onto one of his consoles. <laughs> <laughs> it's Minnie Ian Lee. <laughs> <laughs> when, how did you find this out, Trev? Um, because he came in, he said, this card isn't working. <laughs> <laughs> He's mini Mrs. Lee. I know. And so he, well, he walked into the living room with the, waving the car and said, Dad, the car's not working. He was in the living room. It was actually plugged into the living room. So he was, he was sitting there. I was in the kitchen. And he walked through and he said, this card's no good. It's not working. Blimey. Do, 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 you, do you hide the cards now? Well, I keep mine in my wallet, but he, he took it out of my wife's um, purse. It was my savings account card. Flipping heck. Well, you're very lucky you stopped in. Trevor, listen, you've earned yourself a dead rock star. Is there anyone you'd like to claim? Jimi Hendrix, uh, Mama Cash, Dusty Springfield, Elvis Presley and George Harrison have gone. Who would you like? Oh, right, OK. In that case, then, it would have to be... Oh, I was going for Jimi Hendrix, no, but kind of he's it. gone already. Yeah, it'd be Freddie Mercury. Freddie Mercury. Oh, I, I, thank you very much, Trevor. Oh, great story. The kid worked out the credit card. He couldn't do the numbers at the back. Flipping it. There's part of you that admires that, isn't there? Oh, you've got to respect How that. clever that he got all the details uh, I, in. I've just got to say that it's getting tense on the dead rock stars Why? thing. Well, Paul Scoynes has tweeted. And by the way, you cannot claim your rock stars by tweets, texts or emails. It has to be phone calls. Otherwise, uh, it isn't legally binding. Hashtag BBC rules. Hashtag thanks a lot, Russell Brand and Jonathan Ross. Yeah. But Paul Scoynes has tweeted, um, I want Harris and George and I'm claiming him for Glass Onion. OK. Well, I replied, sorry, uh, Paul Scoynes, you can't have him, he's mine. His reply, have you met him and played a Beatles song in front of him? Well, oh, uh, I see. He wants, uh, and, uh, we can open this up. If you want to fight for a rock star that's gone, if you've got a claim, a stronger claim than someone, 08459 four double five five double five. Can we get Scoynes, maybe about half past seven, can we get him on the phone and um, yeah. let's thrash this let's thr- thrash this out mano a mano. Yeah, on air. Justin Daly's on the line. Morning, uh, Justin. Hey, good morning, boss. I've taken this one to the streets for you. Dead rock stars. Oh, I've got somebody with me. Have you done it already? Yes, I'm here. Good I'm lads. here go with uh, Lorna. Lorna, good morning. Who would you like to claim your dead rock star? Whitney Houston. Oh. oh. Whitney Houston or Michael Jackson? Who's your preference out of those two, Ian? Uh, well, she's got. We, we all made the R sound when she went for Whitney. It's got to yeah. be Whitney, isn't it? <laughs> got to be Whitney. What's your favourite Whitney song? Silence. Queen of the Night. Queen oh, of the Night. Yeah. Controversial. Oh, yeah. Interesting choice. Interesting Lorna, choice. Lorna, she's yours. You can lord over her. Whenever she gets played at a party or in a pub, you can go, that's mine, that is. Oh, I own her. Excited. Justin, who would, you, who would you go for? Um, I think, for me, I'm going to go for an interesting one. What about the Big Bopper? Hello, baby. <laughs> Hello, baby. <laughs> uh, it's good, that. I yeah. find that really creepy. Mm-hmm. Chantilly lace uh, and a pretty face, face and, and a ponytail hanging, hanging down. down. A wiggle in a walk and a giggle in a talk Makes the world go round, round, round Ain't nothing in the world like a big eye girl To make the act so fun and make me spend my money Make me feel real loose like a long leg goose Oh baby, that's what I like Yeah! Yeah, I don't like that Who, who realised we knew all of the words to the Big Bopper? Oh, yes Now, Justin, he's yours, he's on the list You've got him, you can lord over him forever Now, um, we're going to send you out today Because, with ah, there's another story about smoking, isn't there? Yeah, there is actually Another story, there's been uh, some research done, hasn't there? What is it? Uh, well, the research basically is saying what we all know, that if you smoke in front of your children, it's going to damage their health. I mean, it's not exactly well, rocket science, Well, this, you is it? say we all know it, Just, but mm. we've done this, b- this this before. We did it a while ago, and there are still people that will smoke a tab in front of the kids. Page 19 of the mail, it's in a couple of the others. Uh, passive smoking ages the arteries of children. Children whose parents smoke are at risk of permanent damage to their arteries, researchers have warned. A study suggests that exposure to both parents smoking leads to thickening of the artery walls, meaning the children
children will be at greater risk of heart attacks and strokes in later life. That's science there. Science. It is science. So Lorna's still here. Lorna, let me put the question to you. We're live in Luton this morning. How often are you seeing parents still smoking in front of their children? All the time. Um, when you're on the streets. I mean, I think when like you're talking about parents smoking and stuff in the home... I wouldn't do it, but then I think, where do you kind of draw the line? Because it's their home. Yeah. You know that we're a li- we're becoming a little bit too PC. I know it's their health, yeah, and everything else, but at the same time, what, what, are we, are we going to be in a, in a position at some point where we can't even smoke in our own home? Okay, home's one thing, but here on the streets, okay, here on the streets in Luton, you're seeing this what every single day? People yeah. smoking in front of their kids? Yeah, all the time. And when you see that, how does it make you feel? <laughs> I mean, I'm kind of indifferent. I mean, I don't think it's a good thing. But what are you going to do? What am I going to? What is anyone going to do? Go up to someone and say you can't? You can't do that. Mm. Where well, they shouldn't be doing it, though, should they? Come on. It's, it's bad di- for the health. It is. It's, it's a difficult one, though, isn't it? I mean, it really is difficult because, like I said, where do you kind of draw the line? They're outside. It's not like they're blowing it straight in their face. I'm not. I'm not for a minute saying it's okay. But I'm kind of saying, how do you get round that? Okay. Justin, sure excellent done. stuff. I just wonder, you're off next week. Mm. Um, maybe off air. If you could have a word with Lorna, see if she's free between six and nine next week. <laughs> <Would> you, <laughs> she she good. seems good. Justin, she's excellent stuff. We'll speak to you later on. I'm just cutting you short. Uh, we got a, 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 I, I put the call out there, Catherine. It's been answered. Let's call reporter Paul Scoynes on the line. Paul? All right. Yeah, I'm all right. Morning. You, you all right? Yeah, I'm OK. Oh, he's got his fighting I'm, voice on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What are you doing? I'm walking to the train station in. <laughs> Now, a li- little bit of, um, well, I-, I don't want to say cyberbullying, but I'm going to say cyberbullying from you this morning on Twitter. I, I, that's, that's a ludicrous accusation. I wish you to withdraw it. I, uh, I'll do some actual bullying. I've got, <laughs> I've got screen grabs of the, 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 the aggressive messages. You, me. you want George Harrison. You can't have him, sunshine. He's mine. No. He's, no, I'm, I'm claiming Harrison. Tell me, tell me why I'm, you think you deserve Harrison, then we'll put it to the vote. Uh, OK, I deserve Harrison because I've played a Beatles song, several Beatles songs to him what and he's commented uh, how like the Beatles the band I played in sounded so you know well hang on a second I, hang on a second I hang win on. I win at least three of the Beatles because they were all there hang on a second you played yeah. you played what you were in a band was this on your steel, was, a, was this on your steel drums yeah it was a steel band a steel steel band I'm going to get the reactive rollers so you, you were, what Beatles songs did you play on the steel drums Obla Dee Obla Dee has got to be hasn't it it was that yeah. yes <laughs> <laughs> Sounded so much Lady, cooler when we thought it was a guitar. Lady Madonna. <laughs> I mean, admittedly, they weren't in the finest of the Beatles canon, but um, and I think there was another one, possibly Yellow Submarine, but and, I can't remember it now. And how, how many Beatles were there when you played this? Well, I'm just saying three because I'm counting George Martin as a Beatle. Oh wow! Yeah. So, so who was the other actual Beatle? Uh, Ringo. Okay, okay. No, they, they, my two favourite Beatles. I, yeah, okay. I'll give you George Martin. He was indeed uh, one of the many fifth Beatles. Yeah. And, and what well, George Harrison came up to you afterwards and spoke to you. Yeah, they, they, they all did on three. You spoke to the three of the Beatles. Yeah. What? No, no, no. They did a speech afterwards, didn't they? They said thanks no, for inviting us. You were very said, good. No, he came up and said, "Hey guys, that was great." You know, not in that kind of. They weren't from Birmingham, but you know, they. <laughs> 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 Uh, well, do you know what, Paul? I don't even need to put this to the vote. It's, yeah. it's with um, the, the greatest of regret I hand over George Harrison to you, Paul. He's yours. I, I, I will look after him. You promise you and, will? And he's glass on the end. Will, I will. Will you, will you love him? I will love him. And protect him? Always. Forever and ever. George, uh, I'm giving you over to Paul, and uh, this is your new dad. Thanks, Paul. Come with me, George. Come with me. Oh, that sounded a bit. <laughs> I regret it now. Who are you going to have instead? Oh, I don't know. I, I genuinely. I know. Go on. Huh? Johnny Cash. Uh, I, no, I don't want Cash. I feel too much I responsibility. Know. I don't think I want to play this game anymore. Why? Because people will nick them off you. Yeah. I feel a bit sad. I genuinely feel. I want. Do you want another coffee? Yeah, please, mate. Thanks. Powerful one. Thanks for being there, Catherine. Thanks very much indeed. 08459 four double five five double five. Genuinely uh, feel a little bit sad. You can claim if you've got a stronger. If you've got a strong claim for a dead rock star, you can steal them from someone else. Oh, dear. Morning, Ian 
Daily, BBC Three Counties Radio. If you missed the first hour, well... I mean, seriously, guys. Are you committed to us or not? How is this relationship going to work if you can't even be bothered to turn up on time? Let's talk about it after the show, shall we? But I'm disappointed in you. Lots coming up in this hour, including complaints about Milton Keynes Hospital, complaints about Bedfordshire Police, complaints about the education system, and we're giving away dead rock stars. Facebook.com forward slash BBC 3CR. You can send me a text, 81333. Start your text, 3CR. Or, very busy on the phones this morning, and that's the way, uh aha, aha. You can call 08459 455 555. Across beds, hearts and bucks. This is BBC Three Counties Radio. Now... On yesterday's show, we uh, talked uh, about allegations that were being made that two police officers had assaulted an autistic man uh, in Luton. He was out putting the bins as part of his uh, his daily, his weekly routine that he finds very comforting. And um, if accounts are to be believed, he was pushed, he was punched twice at least, uh, and his, uh, his jacket was ripped. Well, Farouk Ali's family caught a public meeting last night in a bid to get answers from Police Commissioner Ollie Martins and Deputy Chief Constable Nigel Tripp. It. Farouk's brother, Dobir Ali, joins me now. Morning, Dobir. Good morning, Lee. Uh, how did things go last night? Um, yes, he went very well. A um, lot of people turned up. Uh, it was a very good response to from, from the community. It got a little uh, bit tense, didn't it? It did. Uh, obviously, it had a little bit of a heated moment. A uh, lot of people in the community were concerned. I was very upset about the, uh, this issue, so they want to raise their concern to the lo- local police. Uh, I heard it descended a little bit uh, into kind of uh, playground taunts and, and, and mocking of, of Ollie Martins and the way he spoke. Was, it, was that appropriate? Well, I mean, Oli Martin obviously could not give a response, and people, people lost their faith and trust in him. And he's talking about election for crying out in a situation like this. What did he say about the election? Well, he said, well, next election, you'll see my ballot paper there. And I'm like, Oli Martin, we're talking about a serious situation here. I don't think you understand the, the situation in hand. And he's talking about election, and I don't think how that would be appropriate. No, but is it, is it true that, it, that, that the focus was kind of taken off of your brother slightly, and it became more about um, uh, r- racial tension or racial uh, d- d- discomfort between the community and the police? Well, I wouldn't say racial tension. I would say more for community tension. Okay. Because uh, what happened was that obviously last November, the incident with Leon Briggs and that in, 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 this incident with Baba. So I think it's more of a concern. I think what well, happened is that the measures put in place for the first incident with Baba, and it's still happening again. So what are the reassurance and what are the confidence can we have in the police? Did you get any answers, Tommy? Well, well, to be honest with you, uh, we got some of the answers, but not all the answers as we expected. A few of the questions we were asked uh, could not get answered, like such as suspension. And a lot of people were asking the, uh, the question, especially the local councillors. And uh, yet, and they would not give us a for answer for that. So they, they haven't been suspended, have they? they they've been put on no. re- restricted duties. What was yeah. their explanation for that? Well, what they're saying is, and uh, they're saying the problem with restricted duty. And when we ask for the suspension, they're like, well, uh, we don't want to suspend them yet due to uh, lack of uh, evidence. Now, when they mean lack of evidence, they haven't actually interviewed the police officers yet. It's now three weeks, and they haven't actually interviewed the officers. And one thing, goodness, the, well, one good thing that came out of the meeting is that um, the, the officers actually mentioned that the, do, the two officers in question did not report the incident straight away. Ah, did they say how long it took for them to report it? They said it was uh, way after the incident was reported, but not straight away. They wouldn't give me an exact answer how long after. I was surprised, Dobby, that the the, uh, the officers yeah. hadn't been interviewed yet. I would have thought if, if it, that would have been done, you know, pretty much immediately. And also witness statements haven't been collected, have they? Absolutely. I mean, I mean, it's quite common sense um, when an incident takes place. You take a statement, you interview the person while, while it's fresh. Now, three weeks down the line, you can interview the officer, they may even remember what happened. And it's actually common sense. Now, putting on a restricted duty uh, rings alarm bell because the incident's taking place 
And it's a common practice for accuser and accusing for a fair, a fair balance investigation. So you suspend both of them and it protects and safeguards both parties whilst the investigation is carried out. Chief Constable Colette Paul was billed as being there. She didn't attend. Was that frustrating? Absolutely. I mean, we tried absolute best to get Claire Paul and get some answers for Claire Paul. And unfortunately, she didn't even turn up, or her deputy. And uh, Nigel, who was the assistant chief constable, turned up as well. But uh, we were quite concerned to see not the chief uh, constable or her deputy turning up. Later on, in about an hour's time, Farouk, I'm going to be speaking to Ollie Martins and also Chief Superintendent Jim Saunders from Bedfordshire Police. Is is there one question or one thing you'd like to say to them? Yes, I mean, uh, there's loads of things coming out of my mind. And one of my questions is, why did, obviously, uh, it's very important that to show the Chief Constable coming and present in this meeting to show uh, um, uh, that they are taking this seriously. And Oli Martin, I'm actually quite disappointed with him because the fact that he's, you know, he's talking about the um, election. And my main question would be that he promised us in his election, that he would take serious accusation very seriously and he would look into himself. What has he personally done for this investigation? Well, 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 we'll clip that and we'll certainly play that, so make sure you're listening in an hour's time. We'll play that to Ollie. What do you do now, Dobby? Well, I'm a youth worker myself. I work with young people myself, so uh, people with disadvantage and with different backgrounds. But how will you take this case further? Well, obviously, uh, we will actually arrange another meeting to, uh, to follow up. And in fact, the one thing very important here is that uh, the police did not give us a timeline when the investigation will be over, when it will get updated, and how long the whole process will take. And it's quite frustrating. OK, well, we'll, we'll, we'll certainly we'll, we'll, we'll ask for that. And, and how is Farouk doing? Um, obviously, uh, he's actually very distressed. He's very distressed. Uh, I mean, it's frightening of people, especially with a police officer and anyone who's dressed in black, really, because my brother came in who was dressed in black and he's a police officer. Mm. So hopefully he'll be recovering. Hopefully we uh, will try to sort of dismantle him. Dobby, I, I wasn't at the meeting last night, but uh, my, my colleague Matt Lockwood was, and as we've mentioned, it, it, it did get very tense. Are you worried... Dobby, that by having these public meetings, uh, that um, I don't want to say hi- being hijacked because that, that's unfair, but 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 there are obviously other issues that people want to raise. Are you worried that this these meetings might actually create more tension between communities and the police? No, I think I think what we does is that it, the, the, this meeting will develop awareness for the community and also have the uh, opportunity for the officers to to justify what's going on and give us a clear update as well as to how far the investigation is, where are we are now, what stage are we going to be and, and, and moving forward. And uh, one thing very important here, uh, obviously, um, Claire Paul has promised that she will personally reinsure the family. Um, and it's been three weeks now, I haven't heard of her, I haven't seen in the house. Toby, I appreciate your time this morning, and uh, do keep in touch. I make sure you're listening just after eight, when we uh, we will be speaking to uh, Ollie Martins, PCC for Bedfordshire, and also Chief Superintendent Jim Saunders. If you were at the meeting last night, give me a call. What did you make of it? Oh eight four five nine four double five five double five. Gary in Luton, I believe you were at the meeting. Is that right? Yes, what, I was. What, what did you What did you make of it? I was obviously quite disgusted, you know. Um, I was uh, obviously, there was no really clear answers from um, the police commissioner and uh, the management team of Beds Police who were there, Nigel Tippett, I believe. You know, they don't really give us a time scale. That's me, what's been, you know, uh, you know how long it's going to take. Um, uh, the offices in question, uh, as you and I know, they haven't been suspended. But after the incident which took place, it took a good few hours for them to report it. Imagine you and I cause an issue within uh, our within office or where we work, our place of work. You know, if we cause the gross misconduct, we'd be suspended pending investigation. Now, I, I assume, or, you know, anyone would assume this would happen in any organisation, regardless if it was public or private office. And why hasn't it happened? They can't even give us an answer. And they don't, you know, they, you know it's just a, a load of nonsense that they've been talking about. And we're very, very disappointed, you know. And Oli, you know, he doesn't give us straightforward answers there. And he starts talking about some election campaign, you know. So he's trying to score points. You know, he says, you know, 
you know, in two years from the ballot paper, we vote him in or we vote him out. I'm, well, I'm afraid he needs to stand down. You know, we lost the faith in him. You know, an incident took place in November where a young man, Leon Briggs, died. This is another incident for the second time, you know. And uh, obviously, you know, the management team are there from Beds Police, but we wanted Colette Paul to be there. You know, neither her or her deputy. Gary, why, why, what good would Ollie Martin standing down do you, standing well, down do you think? What good is he standing up? Tell me. What good has he done? You tell me. I mean, obviously, we want to see him stand down, but why is he, why has he done to put the faith back in the community? I understand there was an incident took place in November. Obviously, there is still an investigation going on. But why has another young man with disability, you know, for the second time being attacked by the police and after the incident, it hasn't been reported straight away. You would expect police officers who are highly trained, experienced, supposed to be professional. OK, an incident took place. They would have reported it straight away. You know, that just shows the mere cover up by the police. Gary, we have to end it there. I really appreciate your call. If you're at the meeting, and I'll, I'll, I'll put some of those points to Ollie Martins about um, why he mentioned the election. Can we get a timeline for this, please? And uh, is he is there at any point is he considering standing down over this? If you were at the meeting last night, or if you have a view on the meeting, the relationship between the police and the community. 08459 four double five five double five. I'm Alice Fossett, BBC Three Counties Radio. Alice, you've had 30 minutes to think about it. We're giving away dead rock stars. Who would you like to claim and own as your very own? Can I have Janis Joplin? Oh, Alice Glossop! Every little bit of information we get about you, I fall in love with you a little bit more. You, J- Joplin is yours, Alice. Yes. Excellent stuff. Thank you. That was a surprise, wasn't it? Across beds, hearts and bugs. This is Ian Lee. BBC Three Counties Radio. Well, it's a busy old show this morning and that's the way uh, that we like it now. Here's a story. Milton Keynes Hospital has been told to apologise to a woman it banned for complaining. The health ombudsman stepped in to defend my next guest, who wants to remain anonymous, but was told the number of calls and emails she'd made to Milton Keynes had reached an unacceptable level. Now, uh, obviously, you want to remain anonymous. Would it be okay if I called you Susan? Yeah, that's fine. That just makes things a little bit easier if we've got a name. (laughs) That's fine. Uh, fine. Susan, is it true the hospital suggested you'd been violent? Yes. Um, when I received the letter, uh, which was dated the 1st of July, I was, um, it was alluded to that I was violent, abusive and abused NHS resources, or to that word. Um, yeah, um, it was, I remember that day very well and I just cried when I read the letter. I just thought, this is absolute lies. Uh, what had led to this? Tell me, tell, give me the background in your own words. Um, well, um, sometimes, because um, I suffer with ongoing medical conditions, I was going in that hospital receiving treatments and sometimes the care was quite bad and uh, I made complaints about that and um, in their view it was too much and um, they restricted my communication which I complied with so they said to me that there's a certain way you communicate with us and I continued to communicate with them the way that they wanted. Um, and then unexpectedly, um, in July last year, I received a letter that um, informed me that I was banned from the hospital. In what way? In what were you complaining about? In what way did you think the treatment you were receiving was inadequate? Oh, for example, having to um, dress your own um, uh, skin condition on a ward, oh. um, which wasn't very pleasant to do. Um, so a nurse, wouldn't, a nurse wouldn't come along and do it. You had to do that yourself. I was given a roll of tape and a pack of dresses and told to dress them myself. Um, and I made a complaint about it, had an apology, and that happened two or three times after that uh, with two separate complaints. And still, they apologised. I was grateful for them to investigate it but uh, nothing improved and that was just one thing there was many concerns about the care experience there and so it was decided for quite a number of years that uh, a management plan would benefit um, helping me when I was having to go in hospital they would know to treat the condition Uh, they would know what medications I would be on but unfortunately that um, was hung on for quite a long time by different members of staff 
who made contact with me and I made contact with them, which also was considered unacceptable. Even though I have emails from these individuals promising this management plan, I never saw. Uh, is, is it true, Susan, that between uh, uh, April and May of 2013, you sent 35 emails and made 56 phone calls to the hospital? Not all, res- but not all were answered and not all were responded to. Sometimes if they didn't respond to an email, after a few days I would send the same email again in case they did not receive it properly, if it got lost in the system, um, or the phone calls weren't answered, um, often go to voicemail, um, they weren't all answered. So it, it was quite frustrating because the communication response, uh, the communication was quite bad. Basically. What did you want, Susan? What response did you want from those emails and those phone calls? What were you hoping to get from them? Well, I was hoping that uh, the care would improve, mm. um, they would learn by the mistakes, and um, I would have actually seen this management plan, which I didn't see until uh, a few months after I was banned. I actually was sent a, an example, like a draft of it, but it, <laughs> it was um, a few months after I was banned. It was it didn't make any sense, and I put that across to them. How could you offer this when I'm being banned from the hospital? And, <laughs> So it's After, very strange. Is it, let me know if I've got this right. And, and I'm not doing this to, to have a go, so please don't think. I'm just trying to get the, the, the kind of timeline no, straight in my fine. head. So after April and May of 2013, those 35 emails, 56 phone calls that weren't all um, that responded to, there was a, a warning from Matron saying staff have been told not to communicate with you other than in relation to complaint, and you, made, you sent a further 21 emails and uh, six phone calls between May and June. Is that right? Um, well, what happened was um, the um, ombudsman investigated and um, the last um, communication I made, I think, was the 17th of May. And after that, the communication was between myself and uh, the security manager um, because um, uh, there was also concerns that they um, uh, sent a officer uh, from the police that worked on the hospital grounds to our home. Um, That's right. They, home. Sent, they sent a police officer... To around to your house come in. yes to warn a letter was coming and then a few weeks later a letter came in Jan- in July so they, said, so they sent the police officer to warn you that a letter was coming what did he say yeah. um, a letter was coming and he came to talk about uh, telephone calls and emails a, a few weeks later he did say that he did not want to be involved it wasn't anything um, you know the police couldn't do anything it wasn't anything criminal and I advise you get a solicitor did you, did you feel Susan that, that the police officer was there to kind of um, uh, scare you is a strong word, but kind of warn you off. I assume so, but I think he was in a difficult situation right. where I think he was being told. Well, I, I hope he, I, I hope he wasn't, but it seemed like he was being told that by the he t- he was told to come by the chief executive, which was a bit worrying. I thought, uh, well, he's he works on the grounds there, so I just, just thought it was very odd. Um, so you received the letter that, that mm. um, uh, d- talked about uh, th- how that it was their duty to protect the staff from violent and abusive behaviour. Mm-hmm. Uh, and is it true that letter was also sent to your doctor, your consultants in London and the ambulance service? Um, it was sent not to the consultant, but to the GP, the ambulance service, um, local community services and other services, um, all services which you might need in an emergency, might need if your GP referred you, but they didn't send it to my consultant, okay, okay. Me, which was reassuring, but they are aware of it and they and, are disgusted by it. And what it. did the ambulance service... Because I imagine that the ambulance service received a letter saying this woman might be violent, or, the, 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 you know, we are protecting our staff from violent, potential violent behaviour. I'd imagine the ambulance service would be a, a little bit reluctant to want to deal with you. Well, um, they said they had no record of any concerns, but they said you have to do a risk assessment. And in some cases, um, one individual told me that um, depending on the individual, they may have to use a police escort, which... Um, well, I, boy, when I heard that, that that was just I just thought, okay, this has clearly got out of hand. It's just it, it, the whole situation got out of hand, and um, the individual that authorised this letter, I, I can't believe that it even got to that stage. Which the CQC, who I've spoken to, have um, uh, expressed concerns that how this even got to a stage well, this is, where they ban me. This is the letter from Darren Leach, isn't it? The hospital's yes, chief yes. operating officer. Yes. You took it to the health service ombud- ombudsman. What happened there? Um, well, they've been excellent. They've been very supportive and understanding. And after a very long investigation, their conclusion was that um, I was not violent and abusive, but the hospital used a template letter from a, a guidelines um, uh, booklet that um, staff use in case patients do 
you know, very bad things like violence abuse. And um, so they used this template letter, didn't it? Didn't take out the um, examples of violence and abuse and left everything in it. Mm. Uh, which the ombudsman have said is the whole letter is confusing. Um, and then a few weeks after I was banned, they added further restrictions where I couldn't go there unless my, uh, unless I, it was life threatening. So basically, if I was dying, uh, you know, or my life was on the line, I was, you know, possibly going to lose my life. That's the only time they would treat me. Um, so it, it, I, further restrictions were imposed, but I didn't do anything wrong, which the ombudsman. You know, said there was no reason why they added further restrictions. The hospital's been ordered to lift its restriction, hasn't it? Has that has that happened? I haven't received any communication from the hospital. Nothing. Okay, and they've they've been told as well to write to your your GP and the ambulance service and all the people they wrote to initially to kind of retract that letter, haven't they, or or, or set um, things straight. I've been told because it's such a a large organisation, it could take a you know a bit of time, but they do have within a month. So uh, within the month of the final letter, which was last Wednesday, so they. Do you you feel, Susan? I'm going to ask a question that might be slightly uncomfortable, but Mm -hmm. let's let's do it. Do you feel any responsibility, in as much as you did send a lot of emails and you did make a lot of phone calls? The care was a a very low standard, and. I was told by members of staff there, make a complaint, make a complaint. It didn't really solve the problem. And I realised at the end of, I think it was last year in May, this matron kept promising me this management plan. Then someone above her sent me a letter, which you just said earlier, that told me off not to communicate with them. That the fact was that individual was communicating with me and visiting me on the ward and sent me emails and I sent her emails. So, um, you know... It, 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 it's just it could have been handled better by staff there personally um, the, it's, the frustrating, complaint- it's frustrating isn't it when you're complaining about something and you're not well, getting you, a response when the care's at a low standard you know sometimes the care there wasn't terrible sometimes it was very good and I was very grateful for their help but sometimes when it was bad it was really bad and I made a complaint hoping they would realise that they made a mistake and they would apologise, but things not, not often change. Susan, I could talk to you all morning. This is fascinating. We're running out of time. Finally, how, is, how has this left you feeling and how, how do you feel now about Milton Keynes Hospital? Um, well, I don't trust them. Um, my family and I are all very upset after what they've done and um, it's given me a very different view of my local hospital. Um, obviously, in the future, hopefully, things may change. I try and see the good in everybody. Um, but uh, this has been a very bad experience and uh, I spent many sleepless nights and many tears about this because it's just I lost all my local services. Um, I lost everything. Uh, Susan, so, uh, well, we, we've got to end it there because we of time, but I, I really, I really okay. appreciate your time this that's morning. Okay. Thank you very much. That's all right. Thank no, you. Thank you very much. That's Susan. That's not her real name. She wants to remain anonymous. What a fascinating story. Well, we did ask, of course, if Milton Keynes Hospital would want to come on. They said no. The chief executive, Joe Harrison, or anyone, they said no. They didn't. They weren't going to come on. We asked for a statement. They didn't oh. give us a statement. We didn't get anything, did Perhaps we? We should send them another email. <laughs> <laughs> Catherine Boyle, you're very naughty. Well, she sound. I mean, look, what, what can you tell from someone for ten minutes on the phone? But she sounded like a very rational, good, calm lady that that had a gripe. And uh, uh, it is our. I mean, we don't know both sides of the story but if you've got a complaint with anything especially a hospital then you should have that right to express that complaint and if staff members are saying to you you must yeah. you must tell them about this you must tell them it kind of puts a bit more wind in your sails and you think i have some information here that could be helpful to someone yeah yeah susan i really appreciate your time this morning thank you very much fascinating story it's coming up to seven thirty. bbc three counties radio let's get the latest travel news now from the owner of janice joplin herself it's alice glossop <laughs> Across beds, hearts and bugs. This is Ian Lee. BBC Three Counties Radio. Well, 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 it's one of those shows. We are just talking about Susan's, uh, Susan's story there at the hospital. Quite incredible. It's one of those shows. We're going from uh, uh, fluffy nonsense like uh, collecting uh, dead rock stars. We are giving them away. The BBC is clearing out its cupboards of uh, old dead rock stars and it's giving them away. Who have we got rid of so far? Who did you two have? Who, who have you? Mama Cat. Mama Cat. Ke- Kelly? At Dusty Springfield. I had George Harrison, but Paul Scoynes, the political reporter here at BBC Three Counties Radio, trumped me. He'd played uh, Obla Di Obla Da uh, on a steel drum in front of George Harrison. So um, he, he wins that. So I haven't got one at the moment. Why don't you have one of your dead monkeys? There's only one. Oh, why don't you have that dead monkey? I might do. What's his name? Oh. 
Do you know? Yes. What is it? Davey. Oh, wait, David, David Jones. Oh. Why don't you have him? Not Alice, Alice Glossop has had... Uh, um, Janis Joplin. Janis Joplin. Justin's got the big bopper. Mm. Um, Lorna's got Whitney Houston. Trevor and Hemel's got Freddie Mercury. Uh, Ryan Blackcat has got Elvis Presley. I know who you can have. The one who sang L- La Bamba, Richie Valens. Oh, I don't want Richie Valens, he's rubbish. Um, and Jim from Langford's got Hendrix, the most overrated guitar player of all time. <gasps> terrible, he's a terrible guitar player. Oh, look, Mum, I can play the guitar on my teeth and do a wee-wee on my guitar. Just play a song, mate. Play a song. Oh, eight four five nine four double five five. Jim Dawes? Jim Dawes. No. Yeah, off of the Morrisons. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's rubbish. So we're talking about that. You can give us a call about that. We're also talking about hospital treatment. And uh, we're talking about the story we mentioned yesterday, uh, allegations that uh, two police officers uh, roughed up an autistic man in Luton. Well, there was um, uh, a meeting in Luton last night, and we'll be speaking to uh, Ollie Martins a bit later on to find out what happened from his point of view. A um, couple of texts on this. Lisa in Hitchin says, when, you know, when you speak to Beds Police later, could you ask what could ever have been the problem with Farouk Ali watching and helping the bin men in the first place? It sounds as if he did that every week and wasn't threatening in any way. Well, that's one side, Lisa. Dave from Sundon uh, seems to take a contrary side. Ian, it's funny how these people wronged by the police or hospital are completely blameless. Autistic people can turn violent very easily. Your thoughts on that? Oh eight four five nine four double five five double five. Dennis is on the line. Morning, Dennis. Good morning. Ian. You got clothes on? Certainly. Good luck. I'm ready to go shopping with my darling wife. Beautiful. What can I no, do for you not. this morning? It's the worst thing in the world. No, I rang about the very question that young lady just asked you. Yeah. Why did the policeman get out of the car and approach this young man? Did he think he was robbing the bins? I mean, that would have been a simple explanation last night the, to say we got out because we thought he was robbing the bins. That seemed, I mean, from we, we, again, we've only heard the side of the brother, so we, I'm treading slightly carefully, but we, yeah. we'll be speaking to the police later on. Uh, but yes, it, it, they thought he was he was uh, causing mischief, basically. And he's a big lad to start with, you yep. know, and, and all right, he's, he's He's only five years old in his head. And I'm sorry about this, but it seems to me it started from nothing and then gradually got worse. You know, I don't know whether he resisted, whether he resisted when they were talking to him, whether he was frightened. I just don't know. And it's time it was sorted out. Because do we know to look after the police, you know, and they look after us? Fair enough. You know, I came from an era when policemen walked around, they didn't sit in a car all the time. It does seem odd, doesn't it, that this happened on the 20th of February. Yeah. And the, uh, the officers, the two officers haven't been interviewed. No. And witness statement, statements haven't been collected. That seems odd, doesn't it? Well, it seems to me, it's, it's, I think they're getting ready to hide it away. If people will stop questioning them, they'll just hide it away. Well, I, I don't, they can't now. They can't now, because this no. is in the public domain. This no. was a meeting. I think the police called last night. So, so no, who, who called it? Catherine? The family called the it. The family called it today. <laughs> OK, right, so it's called by the family. Uh, it, it's out in the open now. It can't go away. We're speaking no. to Ollie Martins just after 8 o'clock. So no, this, this is... The best look to you, Ian. Incidentally, Ian, yes. I watched you on television last night. Are they trying to turn you into a, a rock star or anything what? else? What was was, there was an advert on the telly. I must say that what? Lord Rees, who started you off in 1922... Lord Rees or Lord Rees? Which one? Lord Rees, the one who started yeah. BBC. Yes. Yes. Now, he would have been very disgusted with you last night. What was I doing on telly last night? I was at home. They, they, were, was, they were interviewing you, or they were talking about it, in the studio, obviously, but you were no. not dressed as Lord Rees said you should. Uh, was, this, was, this a, was this the advert for, for this show that they show yeah. sometimes on television? You should, you should have had a shave and you should have been wearing <laughs> evening dress. <laughs> <laughs> Did you, you got to see Kelly Betts in that. Oh, well, that's lovely. I, yeah, Kelly's one yeah, of my favourites. Yeah, Catherine was. And, and me, I was. And uh, Catherine, I've not seen Catherine, but I, from the way she talks, she's a north. She's a north. She's uh, she, a northerner, so she yes. can't be wrong. Well, she Catherine was uh, was off sick that day. There's a surprise. Oh, yeah. Make sure she's on next. I time. wasn't. If you remember, my grandmother was ill. Oh, feel you, bad. You played. Nah, I had to go up north on a mercy dash. You pretended your grandmother was ill to bunk off no, work. No, my grandmother was <gasps> ill. You played that card, Catherine. I can't believe Outrageous. it. Outrageous. Anyway, tell him what I look like, because obviously Dennis needs Sorry, filling in. Gavin, he's, st- did, did he's still wittering on. I thought I'd cut him off. <laughs> what, what are you saying, Dennis? Did you get, did you enjoy going back to Manchester? Well, it was Southport actually, and I've spent a lot of time in oh, hospital. Oh, the, uh, the, uh, the right. posh part of okay. Manchester. <laughs> okay, guys, <laughs> guys, guys. She got better, which is always guys, guys, guys. Guys, this is BBC Three Counties Radio. This isn't BBC Manchester FM dot com. <laughs> so I'm going to cut you off now, Dennis, and Hi, I'm going to cut you off, Catherine. Oh. There we go. Kelly, you're still on. Oh, thanks, mate. You're welcome.
What should we talk about? Well, let's talk about beds, hearts and bucks, shall we? Yeah. Where do you live? Richard's in Winslow. Morning, Richard. Richard. Oh, for goodness sakes. Let's try Tim in Luton. Morning, Tim. Morning, Ian. Like, wh- wh- which dead rock star would you like? Well, not strictly a rock star. Go on, go on. I'd like Bob Marley. No woman, no guy. The reggae fella? Um, yeah. Y- you can have him. Why? Now, listen, I've never got Bob Marley. I've never got reggae. Why do you like it so much? Well, here, listen to this. Well, here, listen to this. There you go, a bit of Bob for you. Well, yeah, <laughs> literally just a bit of Bob. He does it for you. Do you, do you like the fat bass and uh, the laid-back lyrics of Mr Marley? Tim, he's yours. What are you going to do with him? Um, uh, listen. Sounds good to me. It sounds good to me. So much I could say, so much I won't say. Uh, Richard's in Winslow. Morning, Richard. Yo, rock and roll, my man. Before I start, good luck to Susan that was on earlier. Stay strong, girl, if you're listening. Well, well, you're like Mr Motivator, you are. Thank you. Now, listen, I'm phoning in to claim the ambassadorial rights and 10% of all future merchandising royalty to Mr Buddy Holly. Oh, baby. And I want you to play Peggy Sue. I'm not going to do that, but... We jolly will do that. I tell you what, do you know what? We'll play a bit of Buddy Holly tomorrow. No, today. Well, now, I might not be alive tomorrow. Well, th- well fingers crossed. Thank um, you. Yes. Uh, no, I'm not going to play it now, because I've got... Uh, uh, Justin, you'd like me to play some Buddy Holly, wouldn't you? Oh, do you know what? I love Buddy Holly. Legend, yes. Uh, uh, i tell you what, then. <laughs> right, you uh, you own him, Richard. Thank you. We don't normally play songs at this time in the morning. I'll get told off. We don't get me sash. Yes. Okay. Do you, you... You don't get a sash, Richard. <laughs> Yeah, okay. Would you like to introduce Peggy uh, Sue? Yeah, okay. Go on, carry on. No, sh- oh, shut up. Would you like to introduce Buddy Holly and we'll play it? All right, then. Go on, then. This is Ricky Starr, the Blue Star Liner, the All American Surfing King of It is playing Buddy Holly. Take it away now. I'm being swallowed by a boa constrictor. I'm being swallowed by a boa constrictor. I'm being swallowed by a boa constrictor, and I don't like it very much. Justin, what have you been out doing this morning? Um, talking about smoking, something you mentioned in the uh, paper review this morning. Uh, shocking research, uh, research we all know though, uh, which says that children who grow up in a, in a smoke-filled home suffer irreversible damage to their arteries. This was a, a study which looked at more than 2,000 children. Now, Ian, it's very early in the morning to find parents around with children on the school run. I'm sure that's going to come after 8 o'clock this morning, but I have been talking to other people about this. Now, you would think... You you would think that people smoking in front of their children was rare. Um, according to the people I've been talking to this morning, that is certainly not the case. Here's what happened. You've recently given up smoking. Did you ever smoke in front of your children? Not at all. I haven't smoked by in, in front of my children at all. Never? Never at all. OK. So what about what you're seeing every single day? Are you seeing parents smoking in front of their children? Yeah. I've seen a lot of time the people smoking in, the, in front of the children. What, every day? Uh, almost around every day. And when you see that, as somebody who, who didn't do that yourself, yeah. how does it make you feel? It feels very bad because obviously the children, are, they don't smoke, obviously the children uh, harm the, to the children very quickly and it's not good for them. Have you ever been tempted to say to, to those parents, what are you doing? Yes, of course I want to say, but obviously... You can't interrupt in the p- other people's life what mm. they're doing, what they, they have to do and what they don't want to. Well, morning, madam. Um, we're here in Luton this morning. How often are you seeing parents smoking right in front of their there. children? A lot of young mothers smoke in front of their children. You can see it a lot in here, especially young mothers, which is not very nice. What's your thoughts when you're seeing that all the time? Well, it's not healthy for them. It's just, it doesn't look good, but it's not, it's the health mainly. It's not healthy for them. Plus, they, when they see it, they think it's okay as well. So, automatically, they'll probably start smoking as well, you know, at some point. You can see a lot of young children, like even 12-year-olds, smoking outside here, which is not very nice. And this is not something you're seeing once every month. You're seeing this pretty much every single day. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, every day. Yeah. You just pass through the town, you see probably 10 mothers, yeah. 10 mothers in one go, all smoking You'll in front of the children. Plenty of them, yeah, plenty of them. Yeah, definitely. Scott, how often are you seeing parents smoking in front of their children? It's every day when I come into town, pretty much every parent you see usually smokes. 
and I've usually got the kids with them. So you've got a, a child on the way very soon. You are a smoker. Would you smoke in front of your children? I won't, no. Because when they grow up, they might get the habit, you know? Mm. Well, obviously, oh, kids underage, they do smoke. But I don't want my kids to smoke. And how often are you seeing parents here in this town, quite happily walking along with their children, smoking in front of them? I see it all the time, man. All the time. Now they're like, uh, it's one of those things, why would you smoke in front of your kids? My dad used to do it, and it was horrible. Mm. I ended up being a smoker. Uh, But it's a horrible thing to do. Of course, there is now evidence that it's dangerous for your children. The evidence has been there for years, um, even in the year 2014. You would think that this wouldn't be a problem. I mean, talking to people this morning, they've all got their stories. They're all saying, look, we are seeing this every single day. What I'm going to try and do, after 8 o'clock this morning, I'm going to try and find some parents who are smoking in front of their children and we'll ask them a direct question. Um, why are you doing that? Justin, great stuff. Thank you very much, mate. 08459 455 555 745. BBC, I'll come to you in a little bit, Kelly, because I, I want to I squeeze in um, the Alice and uh, the news and the weather, if that's all right. Is that all right? All right, yes. Is that all right? Yeah. And then we'll come to you in a bit. Yeah, OK, mate. I just want to I, I give the comps you're about to give me. I want to give them a little bit of room to breathe. OK, mate. All right. No problem. If you've got a story everyone should hear about, let us tell Dick. them about Dick. it. Dick. This is an old Anglo-Saxon Across beds, hearts and bugs. This is Ian Lee. BBC Three Counties Radio. A Bedfordshire school rated inadequate by Ofsted in 2010 and 2013 is campaigning for more choice over its move to becoming an academy. Robert Bruce Middle School in Kempston has been in talks with the Department for Education, which wants to improve standards by turning it into an academy. Well, in a moment, we'll hear from Ty Goddard, who's the co-founder of the education think tank, the Education Foundation. But before that, let's talk to Shan Hunt, who is uh, the school's chair of governors and is also a Labour Bedford Borough councillor. Morning, Shan. And why has the school struggled to meet Ofsted's expectations? Oh, there was a very difficult time um, with leadership issues until about four years ago. And um, uh, that's the reason that, uh, that, that things dipped. But things. Re- but even in 2013, it was rated inadequate, wasn't it? It was rated inadequate. But if you read the Ofsted in, in uh, report, it says that um, leadership, that a brand new leadership team was, it was in place. And it had only just started. Ofsted came in in September last year when the leadership team, senior leadership team, were being in post for a fortnight. Um, uh, when the inspector came back to do a monitoring visit in January, he said he couldn't understand why the school was in a category and the leadership team had put all the measures in place that we needed to move the school forward very quickly and that the governors were showing strong leadership as well. What was your reaction, Sham, when you heard that Ofsted wanted to turn the school into an academy, uh, academy from September? I was devastated. Um, uh, we had two choices as, as governors. One is that the DFE could come in, um, remove the governors, remove the senior management team, and uh, put their own choice of person uh, in to be old, old, old company in to be uh, to, to be our partner, or the governors could take the decision, albeit reluctantly, unanimously reluctantly, uh, to become an academy. And then we were told we would have a choice of three or four and we would get, be able to get the best fit. But of course, that's not happened. Um, the broker from the DFE, they, they have brokers, goodness knows why, um, the, the broker told us, uh, came in and we had a meeting on Monday and um, we were told basically there was a choice of one. So they might as well have just done this and not gone through this charade um, uh, in, in, in January. You say you're disappointed, Shannon, and I can understand why, but if, if it's ultimately best for the, the, the pupils, then that's got to be a good thing, hasn't it? Absolutely, but what we've got at the moment is best for the pupils. Um, the head teacher has um, uh, started a creative curriculum, which is, to you and me, perhaps topic work, um, rather than stick to the rigidity of the national curriculum. And boys' uh, writing within six weeks went up, goodness knows how many levels, and boys' writing is notoriously difficult mm. to improve. 
I guess I guess the thing is, if it was inadequate in 2010 and inadequate in 2013, th- th- some people might say, well, you know, y- you may have got new leadership in, but y- you've had a good crack of the whip and it's not worked. Something needs to change. Well, what would you say to those people, Shan? I would say go and visit the school, um, get a feel, because you, you, you can feel that the school is better, it's very positive, behaviour's improved dramatically um, over the last three years, um, and even more dramatically um, since September, and um, it's just, it just feels a more positive place. Um, and children are really happy there. In fact, there was on Monday, um, they had a, uh, had a series of um, workshops throughout the day and evening um, for parents to, uh, to go to talk about what the academy could bring. Now, the academy brings with it um, a load of positives. And the positives are um, we could change the school holidays, change the uniform, change the curriculum, do all those sorts of things um, if we wanted to. But, you know, there is a knock-on effect on the rest of Kempston. And what I want is a partner that will bring us a solution for Kempston, not just a solution for Robert Bruce. Shan, I I really appreciate your time this morning. It's uh, Councillor Shan Hunt, who is on the uh, school's chair of governors, joined now by Ty Goddard, who is the founder uh, co-founder of the education think tank the education foundation morning ty academy morning. status it, 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 explain exactly what it is and is it all it's cracked up to be well good question uh, academy status which is being pursued uh, with speed and with vigor uh, by the present government is uh, a way of making schools independent of Uh, local authorities, allowing schools a level of autonomy that perhaps they haven't had before and is perceived by this government uh, and indeed there's there's some evidence of of, of the research as as a way of uh, helping schools to improve. Does enough preparation go into deciding when schools become academies? Well, I think your conversation, and look, let's, let's be very, very frank. Uh, I mean, there were strengths and weaknesses, uh, and I think that's been accepted by Councillor Shanahan. I think she's also the chair of governors, and, and she's doing exactly what you would expect and want from an active, passionate chair of governors. She's, she's looking at what is best for the school, uh, best for the pupils in, in, in that school. She accepts that there's been some difficult times, and it must have been difficult for, for governors, uh, staff, and indeed senior leadership within that team. But I think what she's uh, exposing is that you know the governors have uh, agreed unanimously to go to, to pursue the uh, academ- academy route, and um, they they've got to undergo those decisions mm. because after all they are they are the responsible body for that school. What are the potential pitfalls of academy status? Well, the pitfalls uh, in well recently we've seen in the news that you know academy status isn't isn't a magic wand. It is actually about how you use that independence, how you use the autonomy that academy status gives you, the freedoms uh, that, that that are within uh, that that status. But it's also about focus, uh, and it has to be about the focus from the governing body. And look, th- we we need to celebrate what's good in that school but we also need to be frank and Ofsted was frank and I think also the chair of governors was frank um, that there are weaknesses there are there were weaknesses at, at inspection and the government has clearly and you know I'm not here uh, as, as a cheerleader we're an independent think tank uh, but the government has clearly made a, a decision um, that the rate of improvement can actually potentially be speeded up by uh, going up, going uh, towards academy status. Ty, thanks very much for your time this morning. It's uh, Ty Goddard from the Education Think Tank, the Education Foundation. Call 08459 455 555. BBC Three Counties Radio. You can have your say about that or any of the things we're talking about by dialing that number. Now, we're giving away dead rock stars. Uh, to, to claim them, you have to call in. And not everyone's got that, have they, Catherine? No. 
we've got a lot of chances on the Twitter. Go on, what do they we say? even you know? Do we even read them out? We'll, we'll read them out because we'll, we'll do. We'll give them that decency. But you're, you're, the BBC guidelines state very categorically: if we are giving away deceased persons, whatever their career choice, it, they can only be done on the telephone. So, Mark Nichols, you cannot have Carl Wilson or indeed Dennis. Oh. I'm sorry, it's not going to happen. No. Nope. Uh, Liquor till happy tree thirteen. Is it possible to pre-order someone and have them put behind the counter for when they go? Again, trying to bend no, the rules. We, we've got to. And I've got to say this sick pre-booking of people who are still alive. People have had someone putting in an early bid for Dolly Parton. Paul Scoynes has even suggested Paul McCartney. No, we're not playing that sick game. Car- we're not playing that sick game. Carpet Martin wants uh, Michael Hutchins or Karen Carpenter. Um, and Linda would like uh, Lisa Left Eye Lopez here at TCL. <laughs> But she also calls her uh, uh, Lisa Left Eye Lopes. <laughs> Isn't there a Z at the end of Lopez? Is this Unless she's Portuguese. One? I'm not sure about the spelling there. Uh, uh, Albert's on the line. Morning, Albert. Morning, Ian. Hey, you're, you're, you're drinking the same stuff that we've got this morning. Drink cleaner. Yes. Can't uh, beat it. Yes, you can't beat it. Well, well, you'd like a dead rock star, would you, Albert? Jim. Yes, I would, please. I've got an absolute pocket for you. Go on, then. Marilyn Manson. Sorry? Marilyn Manson. She clearly died years back. Are you... I, I think... Do you want to tell him, or shall I, Kath? Um, well, what? are you sitting down, Albert? Yes. Marilyn Manson's a fella. Hey. And he's still alive. No, 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 no. You've seen the, you've seen the colour of her skin and her hair and her eyes hanging out and everything. She's definitely a man... No! And she's definitely alive, Albert, so I'm afraid you can't have Marilyn Manson. Oh, for goodness sake! Who's misled me? I, 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 I don't know, Albert, I just don't know. And very quickly, uh, Kelly, give me some comps. Some comps? Lynn and Bletchley called in. Yeah. She said, all right, love, I saw... She doesn't speak like this, but I'm just... Do it in do that it voice, like yeah. I'm doing it in this voice. I saw Ian on that advert. Four, oh, isn't he handsome? Oh. oh, I love him. He's such a good man. And I love all you girls as well. I love it. I tell all my friends oh. about it. Did she so, actually say four? Four, no. Oh. She, she doesn't talk like that either. But she said something like that. But she anyway. said, yeah, it was along those yeah, lines. Let's go to the travel show. <laughs> Excuse me, I'm all over the place at the moment. Just give me a second. Just give me a second. That's better. We've been drinking some very, very strong coffee this morning. I'm not sure if this stuff is even legal in this country, man. Lots coming up between now and JVS at nine o'clock, including complaints about Bedfordshire Police, complaints about Milton Keynes Hospital, and complaints about the education system. I know. On a lighter note, we're giving away dead rock stars. Who do you want? You've got to phone up and claim them, otherwise it, it just doesn't work, I'm afraid. 08 459 455 555. Across beds, hearts and bucks. This is BBC Three Counties Radio. You can also go to facebook.com forward slash BBC 3CR or you can send me a text 81333, start your text 3CR. Now, allegations that uh, Bedfordshire police officers assaulted an autistic man were discussed in a heated meeting in Luton last night. According to Farouk Ali's family, things got physical when police tried to move him on. His autism means that he's a creature of habit and he likes and needs to watch the bins being collected every week. Well, it seems the police thought he was acting suspiciously. The Ali family wants the policemen involved to be suspended while the investigation takes place. Instead, they've been placed on restricted duties. I'm joined in the studio by Ollie Martins, who's the Bedfordshire Constabulary Police and Crime Commissioner. Morning, Ollie. We'll come to you in a second. First of all, let's talk to uh, Chief Superintendent Jim Saunders from Bedfordshire Police. Morning, Jim. Good morning, Ian. Why were the officers in the area of Luton where this incident happened? Was Was it a routine patrol? It was a routine patrol. Um, they weren't sent there for any particular reason. Um, and uh, as they were there, they, their attention was drawn uh, to Mr Ali. Um, and they, these officers got out of the car. They were concerned about him, went over to speak to him. And the incident developed from there. What happened? Well, I, don't, I can't go into the detail of what actually happened because that's subject now to an investigation. And, and we need that investigation to take place. That investigation is being led by our professional standards department. 
uh, and he's been overseen by the IPCC. We've spoken to, to Farouk's brother. There are claims that uh, Farouk was thrown into the bins and punched at least twice and his jacket was ripped. Does that tally with what you've heard? Uh, well, that's, that's what's been alleged. Um, what I can say is the, um, the first account the officers have given in relation to this incident is significantly different to that. In what uh, way? Oh, I'm, not, I'm not going to go into that because that is what the IPCC supervised investigation needs to determine. Because the officers didn't give their account until quite a while after the incident, did they? Uh, that, that is true. The officers uh, did leave the scene um, and continued to do their, uh, their work. And is that, uh, is that normal police practice? Well, they, what actually happened, the officers, when they returned to their base, they then spoke to their supervisor and reported the incident to the supervisor. Is that normal police practice? Uh, well, uh, th- again, this is something that needs to be uh, t- to be investigated. Well, well, is it? I mean, I don't, I, I, I don't know. I'm, it's a genuine question. Is it normal police practice to be involved in an incident and then not report it for a few hours? It depends on what the incident is um, as to whether you would report it or not. The officers themselves would have to account for why they did not report it immediately. The, the key point is when they did report it, immediately the supervisor became aware. Uh, they then reported that up uh, through the management chain. Uh, and we realised the, the significance of this situation. Professional standards were immediately notified and began an investigation. You say an investigation has been done I- immediately. This incident happened on the 20th of February. The, o- the officers haven't been interviewed yet, have they? Uh, that, that is correct. So that, uh, it sounds it, like the, the, the uh, investigation is, it, it hasn't really taken off. Surely that'll be one of the first things that people would do. Well, well, there are certain things. First of all, the officers did give an account, and they, as they would normally do. But it. they haven't been interviewed as part of the investigation. No, they haven't been interviewed, but they gave an account uh, in their pocket notebook. And witness statements haven't been collected. Well, just hold on a minute, Ian. So, so that was done. The clothing um, and forensic evidence was seized. Photographs were taken. House-to-house inquiries were done at the time. So the investigation did start um, immediately. Yes, you're correct. They haven't been interviewed. They will be interviewed. Have in witness court. statements been collected? Uh, some, I, I don't know the details. It was said at the meeting last night that they hadn't. I, I can't definitely say that all witness statements have been taken in relation to this, but witness statements will be taken. So over two um, weeks over two weeks after the incident, you claim the investigation started on the day of the incident, the 20th of February. Yes, it Witness did. statements haven't been collected, and the two officers involved haven't been interviewed. That sounds very poor, Jim. Well, I... Uh, as I said, the officers have provided an account of what happened and the investigation has begun in that, as I say, uh, forensic evidence at the time was, was secured, um, photographs were taken, CCTV was checked. Um, but so, you yeah. haven't interviewed the two officers that, that were a part of it, so they're at the centre of the claim, over two weeks after the investigation has begun. That, that is correct. Um, that, and that's very poor, isn't it? I wouldn't say that was poor. That's acceptable, um, that, that is it? Is, that, and again, the, as I say, this is being led by the Professional Standards Department. They will have to uh, explain to the family why these um, interviews haven't taken place. You can understand why, why people were very upset last night, can't you? If, if t- over two weeks into an investigation, the people at the centre of the allegations haven't been interviewed. Well, that would be very frustrating, wouldn't it? it, it as, as I said, the officers have given an account of what happened. I think what you need to bear in mind is the, the investigating officers need to get the full p- picture. They need to speak to witnesses, gather all the evidence, and then carry out the interview with the officers to determine exactly what happened. That wouldn't be one of the first things you'd do. That seems odd. I would have thought not, not this, necessarily the first thing. I would have thought if someone had been accused thing. of something, you'd, you'd interview them immediately. Well, the, the first thing you would do is get an, an account from them, because and, at which the officers, we have got those accounts from the officers. What but that's we, what prompted the investigation, isn't it? The officers reported the matter, okay. and, and as a result of what they said, concern was raised about what had happened. Why have they not been suspended? They haven't been suspended because, and just to be clear about this, the decision around suspension, again, is a matter for the Professional Standards Department. They t- treat each case uh, on a case-by-case me- uh, basis. Um, some officers are suspended from duty, and some are placed on restricted duties. On this occasion, the decision at the time was to restrict those officers. What does restricted that, duties mean? It, it means it can mean a variety of things. What does it mean in this case? In this case, it means they will not be working in the Luton area. 
um, so to avoid any kind of um, further uh, contact. Or but contact. they will still be on the street somewhere else? They, they will still be carrying out uh, police work in other parts of the county. Can I just also say that that decision is under constant review. We I, Certainly, I was at the meeting last night. I certainly heard very clearly the, 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 the perspective of the community um, and that decision as to whether they should be uh, continuing on those restrictions or be suspended will be continuously reviewed. What's the timeline for this? That's a question that a lot of people are asking. When can we expect to, to get answers? I can't give you a precise timeline because it depends on the scale of the investigation. Uh, but what I can say is the investigation is going to be supervised by the IPCC who will be clear in terms of their expectations in timelines. I can also reassure you that ACC Trippett, who was at the meeting last night, will be speaking this morning to the head of professional standards uh, to get some assurances from them in terms of what their timeline is, and that will be communicated as soon as we possibly can back to the family. Kenny Redbourne has texted in, Jim, and I'm sorry to keep going back to this, but I do think it's a significant thing. I'm, I'm very surprised by some of your answers. Ken says, shouldn't the officers have been interviewed separately, ASAP, otherwise they now have had time to get their story straight? Well, as I said, they, they've already made an account. They have... No but, the, Jim, the account is different. The account from their notebooks is different from being sat down and interviewed, isn't it? To be honest, Ian, until you know what it is you're going to interview your officers about... We're interviewing them about the allegations that they roughed up an autistic man with the mental age of a five-year-old. But at the, at the time, when the incident first happened, we didn't have all the details of that. The investigation needs to go through that process, gather all the evidence... Oh, Jim, people, there will be people listening. There will be people listening who thinks this sounds like some kind of cover-up by the police. You know, you know what the allegations are. Why haven't they been interviewed? We know at the time, as I say, the officers made a report in their pocket notebooks. Once the investigating officers have secured all the evidence... They've had they two need. weeks to get together. I'm not suggesting this is what they're doing, but this is what these suspicious listeners might think. They've had two weeks to get together and say, right, this is what happened, let's stick to our story. Well, they, they, they've, as I said, they've already recorded what, the, what happened in their pocket notebooks. The interviews will take place once the investigating officers have secured all the evidence they need from witnesses, from CCTV if that's available, from the forensic evidence which needs to be analysed and then when they've got the full picture they will go and interview those officers having all the, the detail they need to, to do a proper and thorough interview. Jim, thank you very much indeed. Chief Superintendent Jim Saunders, joined by Ollie Martins, Bedfordshire uh, Constabulary Police and Crime Commissioner. Morning, Ollie. Hi, Ian. A uh, couple of questions that we've had uh, from uh, listeners. Um, not everybody was at the meeting that was supposed to be at the meeting last night, were they? Why is that? Uh, not sure what you mean. Well, uh, I've, I've forgotten the lady's name, which is why I'm just... I'm just Colette You've was supposed to be there. You've forgotten the chief constable who you interviewed. Ollie, I listened. Uh, she was uh, very, very charming. I've forgotten her name. Yes, Colette. She wasn't at the meeting. Why not? She was, it was told she was going to be at the meeting. Why wasn't she there? Um... She was represented by uh, senior police officers. Why She's wasn't Colette there? Why? Well, I was there. Why wasn't Colette there? It was people were told that Colette was going to be there. They felt um, no, they, were, they felt let down that she they was. Were, they were told that she would endeavour to be there. Okay, but why wasn't she there? Because she had other commitments. What she, was she doing? She that is, was so important. She is responsible for policing the whole county for crime, for counterterrorism. It has she been has alleged an extensive range of duties. Ollie. But that doesn't mean that she doesn't take this extremely seriously. It has been seriously. alleged that an autistic man with the mental age of a five-year-old was beaten up by police. Surely she should have been there. That was an important thing. What was she doing that was so important? I'm not responsible for managing her diary. Okay, so you don't know what, where she was? No, I don't. You didn't ask her to be there? No, I mean, I'm there as the person that is responsible for holding her to account. The assistant chief constable uh, was there. Officers who are directly involved in the investigation and in handling this matter were there. People felt disappointed and the assistant chief constable was there, not the chief constable. And you can understand why they would feel disappointed. There's a lot of tension in the community. People uh, were, were disappointed she wasn't there. I think the force was represented at the appropriate level. I think the chief constable is taking a very close interest in this. You don't the know where she was. The chief constable has written to the family the chief constable has offered to meet the family uh i think that she is uh properly engaged in this matter you don't know where she was no, I don't know where she was. I don't. I'm not responsible for her no, day-to-day management no, of, or the of, management. Of course, of you're not. But diary. if she was, at that is not my role as police and crime. No, of commissioner. course it's not. But, but I am there to hold her to account, and I can assure you that I will be doing so. No, of course, you, you're not responsible for her diary, Ollie. But this is such a big thing that it must have been something pretty. Did you not ask her why can't you make it? Did you not ask her where she was going to be? 
I think that the force was represented at the appropriate the level and the right, the right people were present at the meeting. But the public don't think that. And this is all about, isn't it? It's all about trying to soothe the public and speak to them and understand them. You've gone in already several points down by Colette not being there. Did you not ask her where she was, why she couldn't well, make it? I don't, I don't think that whether the chief constable was there or not is the issue here. So you didn't ask you know, her where she was? I it's was, one of the issues. I was representing, uh, I, I was there, uh, you know, in my role as police and crime commissioner. I am the person who is responsible for holding the chief constable to account. The force was represented at a senior level. Uh, and I'm satisfied with that situation. Lots of people last night were very surprised that you were talking about elections. What was that all about? The point I was making is that I'm democratically accountable and that that is a significant change from the form of police governance that we've had in the past and that now you have someone who is accountable, uh, who can be sacked at an election if people are not happy. In two and a half years' time? Indeed. Indeed. People want action now, though, don't they? They don't well, want to wait two and a half years. They want, they want action now. And I will ensure that this matter is properly investigated, that there is accountability, okay. and that is my role as Police and okay. Crime Commissioner. And if the point I was making is, if in two and a half pe- years' time people are not satisfied, then they can express their view through the ballot box. And that is not something that people were able to do. There was no direct democratic accountability for the police before the advent of police and crime commissioners, and that is the point I was making. OK, so y- your, your responsibility is to hold people accountable. What are you doing? Well, I was at the meeting last night. But what are you doing practically? Well, I will be holding the Chief Constable to account. We've already had uh, a number of conversations about this. I'm very keen to see the investigation uh, proceed expeditiously to get to the bottom of what happened. And if the officers need to be held accountable, then they will be. If there are points that the organisation needs to learn about how it deals with vulnerable people, then I can assure you those points will be uh, pursued and that learning will take place. We are literally weeks away from the introduction of body-worn cameras. I mean, I think it's... That can be uh, switched on at the choice of the police officers. They will be... The guidance will be that they should be switched on for encounters with the public. Okay. Um, that doesn't help Mr. Ali, though, does it? it? So, so how are you holding... It doesn't, but how it's, are you something holding? That, it's something that I think... You know, I've been okay. very keen to see this technology rolled out for, you know, since I've learnt about it about a year ago. And that's ago. great for the future, and that's great that's coming Indeed. in. How are you holding... Because I don't know how this works, so explain it to me as, as, as I'm an idiot, because I am around this. How are you holding the, the chief constable and the police to account? What have you done practically? What do you do? What do I do? I ask... You know, re- regularly meet the chief constable. About this incident specifically? I've sp- had lengthy conversations with How her soon after this. the incident did you speak to her? I don't know, last week sometime. OK, so a week after the incident... And and what do you say? What's going on? What do, do, do you meet up with her? What, how does it work? Yeah. I was like, you know, what's happening? How quickly is it going to be investigated? In fact, a lot of the similar questions that the public were asking last and night. And what answers have you had? Well, similar, you know, to what the public were told last night. And um, For example, what's going on and how long will this take? Those are the two questions. So what are the answers you've had from Colette Paul? Well, I think that the fact that we have an investigation um, that is being conducted by the uh, Professional Standards Department but overseen by the uh, IPCC is actually, um, in a way, it's the best of both worlds because it will ensure that the uh, the inquiry is likely to be concluded faster than your typical IPCC inquiry, and yet at the same time the public have the insurance that it is be- assurance that it is being looked at um, by people external from the force. So what's the timeline then? It'll be quicker than your normal IPCC I, inquiry. Uh, people won't know what that means. It, well, I think it will, you know, months rather than years. OK, so months. Hopefully not that many months. I mean, you know, it's, it's going to depend on um, what evidence uh, emerges um, and, you know, the statements that people give. It's the, the second kind of big incident in recent times for Luton Police. Uh, it doesn't look great, does it? It doesn't, but I think you've got to bear in mind that actually police officers 
spend quite a large amount of their time. Uh, you know, our response officers, on average, spend about 50% of their time dealing with incidents that relate to vulnerable people. You know, this it's a, it's a daily occurrence, whether it's a missing child, whether it's a safeguarding issue, whether it's someone with mental health problems who's threatening themselves, uh, threatening to harm themselves or other people. The fellow just most watching the, the big men. Most of the time, most of the time, those incidents pass without note, uh, without becoming newsworthy. And it I think d- it's that important. doesn't make it that doesn't no no doesn't it make doesn't, it acceptable for allegations no, of a uh, police officers punching an autistic doesn't. man, does no, it? No, because it they're good ninety nine percent of the time. It doesn't. But I think it's important context before we get carried away with the idea that. Um, you know that, that this is somehow normal, and that this, uh, this is how the police and that has never been with, suggested on this, this show. This is how the, pe- the police interact with with vulnerable people, that, and that's never been suggested. But but you know, if, if they're great nine times out of ten, it still doesn't make the one time. Well, I think it's more than nine times. I'm out using of 10, that as an example. But you know, we've had Leon still, Briggs. We've had Leon Briggs. This is still. You know, you know the point uh, I was trying to make. We've had Leon Briggs recently, of course, the, the death of Leon Briggs. We've got Farouk Ali. All in a very kind of short space of time. It doesn't look good for Luton Police, does it, at all? In terms of what I'm trying to do, uh, building the strongest possible relationship between local communities and their police, this is, you know, the last thing I need. Um, But that is exactly why I take this very seriously and why I'm absolutely determined to get to the bottom of what's gone on with these incidents. And you're doing that by making a few phone calls? I do that by regularly holding the chief constable. Have you seen the evidence? Have you seen the photographs of Farouk Ali after the incident? I have, yes. What did you see in those photographs? I saw bruises and abrasions. Okay. We've had uh, um, Leon Briggs, Farouk Ali, of course, the investigation into into, uh, your misdemeanours. We've had people this morning asking, are you going to stand down? Are you? I think uh, it was interesting last night which was, of course, a very heated public meeting. Um, And, you know, the issues in relation to me barely rated for a mention. So I think people recognise that I've been quite frank about my You're still being investigated? I am being investigated. I mean, ironically, I think at the end of that process... um, I'll probably come out in a better position because the matter has been so thoroughly investigated and I'm still confident that I'll get a clean bill of health at the end of it. Mm. And I think that... For those who don't know, you're being investigated about about telling secrets to to someone that you shouldn't have told about about Leon Briggs. There was a disclosure disclosure of information that shouldn't have been disclosed. Are you going to stand down? That's correct. I don't think that my standing down would, would help. I think I've got important work to do. I don't think quitting helps in the in these circumstances and I don't think you know that is not what the public are focused on I think the people last night you know they actually want to have confidence in their police but they don't do that at the moment and that it has been undermined by these recent events and that's why you know I've got important work to do as the bridge between the public and their police and I'm determined to do it and I'm not a quitter these have happened on your watch these incidents so it would appear that the the, the work uh, at the moment isn't working there's certainly setbacks but you know there is a lot of there is a lot of work that i'm doing hang on the death of someone in police custody claims of an autistic man being beaten up by the police you revealing things that you shouldn't have revealed to someone they're more than setbacks aren't they They're, they're, they're they're all quite huge there's a lot there is going to be a lot of work to do to restore public confidence there's no there's no doubt there's no doubt about that but it's absolutely what we've got to do you know i've been on your program countless times before talking about the financial challenges that the force faces talking about the fact that police numbers are falling the only way we can keep our county safe is to have the highest level of public confidence in the police that we can get to get the closest working relationship uh, and the only people that will benefit uh, if we don't succeed you know are the criminals and extremists but people are uh, some people don't feel that the county is safe because of these incidents that have happened because of leon briggs because of farouk ali well, as will, will more names as, be added to that I've, list as i as i've said i think you know these 
incidents, yes, you know, there is no doubt about the severe impact that they have, but day in, day out, Bedfordshire police officers are dealing with vulnerable people, uh, they're catching criminals, you know, they're doing the work that people expect them to do, and most of the time, I think they do a very good job, and they take a great deal of, you know, they put themselves uh, in dangerous situations to do that, and they're very, they're very committed. Now, I want to find out what happened uh, in these incidents um, to get us the circumstances that we've seen. But we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that most of the time Bedfordshire Police serves the public of this county very well. Are you confident that more names won't be added to that list? Leon Briggs, Farouk Ali, is it going to win there? Well, I certainly hope so. And that Are you would confident? Be, it, would be my ex, it would be my expectation, yes. I mean, I've, I've got to know the force pretty well in the last 14 months as police and crime commissioner i've met a lot of officers i think they are a very committed group of people i think that most police officers will be as mortified as anyone about the circumstances that we've seen but we've got to allow the investigations to take their course and we've got to we've got to get to the bottom of what happened and understand what happened without su- jumping to conclusions. Are you as surprised as I am that the two officers haven't been interviewed as part of the investigation? Because if I if I went out and punched someone, or if if I went out and knocked someone over in my, or if I went out and did something wrong, I'd be interviewed immediately. And yet, two weeks into the investigation, they've not been interviewed. Are you surprised by that? I think, as you've heard, they've been asked to give an account of their actions. And now the investigating team have gone away to collect statements and to collect and to look at the evidence. Once the evidence is assembled and once the investigating team have built up um, the information that they need to understand the incident, that is the appropriate point to interview the officers. So you're not surprised they haven't been interviewed two weeks into the investigation? That doesn't surprise you? No, I mean, I think... I think the point at which you interview them is once the investigating team have got a full picture of what happened. And that means, you know, once they've got that comprehensive picture, um, they know the questions that they need to ask the officers. And witness statements haven't been gathered? That, is that surprising? Or is that standard I practice think as, in an investigation? I think, as you've heard, door-to-door inquiries have been undertaken. Mm. I think the, um, the investigating team will know who they need to get statements from, although I would say if there are people who haven't been contacted by the police who did see what happened, uh, then they should contact the force by ringing 101. Are you happy with Luton Police Force? As I say, by and large, I think Bedfordshire police officers do a remarkable job. I'm not happy that incidents like this happen, but when you're doing a difficult job, sometimes things go wrong. Ollie, thank you for coming in today. I appreciate your time this morning. It's uh, Ollie Martins, the PCC for Bedfordshire. 08459 455 555 is the telephone number if you want to give us a call. Mm-hmm. You can also send me a text, 81333. Start your text, 3CR. Across beds, hearts and bugs. This is Ian Lee. BBC Three Counties Radio. He's late, he's great, he's on his way to a date. It's Jonathan, but you're not on your way to a date. It's just the third rhyming word I could think of. Not, a, not as far as I'm aware, well, but there's still time. The day is young. It's only 8.30 in the morning. Who knows <laughs> yeah. where, thank you very much for your patience. We, oh, we, we kept fine. Ollie a little bit longer than uh, perhaps uh, it, well, anyone thought we <laughs> might do. <laughs> Certainly longer than he wanted to be kept. Yes. But uh, well done him for coming in. What's on your show today? Coming up on the big phone in this morning, would you like the government to make sugary food more expensive? What? I heard this story today. Yes, I have. Britain's chief medical officer, Dame Sally Davies says a tax on sugar may be necessary to stop people getting fat. She told MPs it's likely sugar is addictive and if the food industry won't remove sugar from their products it's time we started taxing them instead. Dame Davies is horrified that being overweight is now normal and she's concerned this generation may be the first to live shorter lives than their parents. 
Uh, the Department of Health says food companies have made voluntary pledges to reduce the calorie count in their products, but campaigners say this doesn't necessarily mean reducing sugar. Well, from nine this morning, I want your views on this. Would you like the government to make sugary food more expensive? It costs something like £5 billion a year to the NHS. Yeah. Obesity alone. Yes. That's how much it costs. And they say that in future years, that's never mind going to double, it's going to triple. Blimey. So that money's got to come from somewhere. Perhaps people listening to the programme think this is a great way of generating that money. You know what? If you want to eat gatto, if you want to eat a great big massive bar of chocolate, then fine, eat it. But you'll have to pay more for it because you have to recognise that eating that kind of food is going to make you fatter, which then may well increase your chance of getting unwell. You'll need the NHS's help. Yeah. So do you think that it's perfectly reasonable and acceptable to make sugary foods more expensive? Would you like the government to do it, or do you think it's very unfair? I'd like your views on 08459 455 555. And can I just say, after 10 as well this morning, we will discuss the case of the teacher who taped the children's mouths shut. Shameful behaviour. Disgusting. Ah. Well, we'll see if the listeners agree with you after 10. You've got a smirk on your face, which makes me think you might be saying something slightly controversial. Me? No. Never. Across beds, hearts and bugs This is Ian Lee BBC Three Counties Radio I wish you could have just heard what Jonathan Vernon Smith said That I can't tell you Oh come on, you can't do that I I can tell you guys Across beds, hearts and bugs This is Ian Lee BBC Three Counties Radio I told the team I told the team Jonathan Vernon Smith The child catcher Well I never <laughs> It's going to be controversial um, uh, Ollie Martin was, was, uh, was in charge Nice to meet Ollie Martin Very uncomfortable uh, for everybody concerned there I think When I brought your coffee in Your face was really red I know it was But fair play no, I Listen at the end of it We shook hands And uh, I thanked him for coming in It's good He good mm-hmm. he, at least he no. comes in. He could, and listen, and you have to respect him for that. He could have very easily said, I'm, I'm not coming in to talk about this, I'm afraid. And he came in. So, well done. You may not have liked the answers, but he came in. Lee's in Luton on this subject of Farouk Ali and the uh, allegations that the police uh, punched an autistic man with the mental age of a five-year-old. Lee, what would you like to say? Um, well, first of all, I don't know how you kept your call without Ollie Martin. So well done. That, well, it's, it's, a lesson that, it's a lesson that I've learnt over time. I, it, it, maybe a year ago I wouldn't have done, but you, you, you get the more out, most out of people by kind of biting your tongue sometimes. Yeah, because he didn't actually answer one question you asked him, did he? It, well, but, he, he, yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. Yeah. Um, first of all, if, if that was me or you that assaulted someone and they died in custody or whatever's happened... Well, 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 well he didn't die. Let's just, let's just clarify. And this, this, we, we're confusing two stories here. We're confusing Leon Briggs. The, 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 this incident is a, a, a gentleman, an autistic gentleman, was outside um, uh, watching the bin men, uh, and if we believe the reports of his family, and that's all we've got at the moment, the police pushed him into the bins and punched him twice. That, that's, that, and that's coming from his family. So g- away you go. Right, OK. Well, if that was me or you that done that to somebody, wouldn't, would we not be arrested straight away and interviewed the same day before we were released? Well, this is the point that I was, I was really trying to make with Ollie uh, and uh, with the, the, the police officer we spoke to, Jim Saunders, the chief superintendent, that that would be the case. And they both seemed quite happy that the, the, the accounts had come from the police officer's pocketbooks and yep. that, in, in their opinion, it was appropriate to interview the police once they had the whole picture, yeah, I so would have thought. The, story straight, yeah. Well, I would have thought that the police interview would have been part of the whole picture. Yeah, well, listen, I, I got arrested years ago for assault on someone. I got into a bit of a fight years ago, and I was arrested immediately. I was taken to the police station, I was put in a cell, and then I was interviewed about five or six hours later. I was then given a court date to appear in court for a, literally a week later. So my case was done and dusted within a week. Now, why, why are the police allowed to carry on doing their jobs, whether it's restriction of, restriction of duties or whatever? Why should they be allowed to carry on with their work so they can go and assault somebody else? And I would, Lee, thank you for that. I would suggest that when Bedfordshire Police, when Luton Police are under scrutiny because of what did happen to Leon Briggs, uh, and, uh, you know, people are watching them, and there are tensions, as was evident at this, evident at this meeting last night rightly or wrongly there are tensions and i would have thought 
the Bedfordshire police would have had to have been seen to have acted very, very quickly. I, I, I would have thought it would have been in a public um, relations interest, if nothing else, to suspend the police officers and make it obvious they've been sus- suspended. To start the investigation immediately, to interview the officers immediately. So that they can be seen to be doing something. Whether that's the, the, the right or the wrong way of handling these things, they need to be seen to be doing something, don't they? Oh wait, four five nine four double five five double five is the telephone number if you want to give me a call. Glenn's in Luton. Morning, Glenn. Morning, Ian. What would you like to say? Yeah, um, well, Lee, Lee's point to say, and your whole show this morning, and that meeting last night with Nigel Trippett and Ollie up up on the stage there, doing what he just done to you, basically make, making it clear to the town. And you know, I've known this for years, mate. But making making it clear to the town, there's no such thing as police accountability. All of the systems, the IPCC, the Police Commission, the so-called oversight commissions, are corrupt. They won thousands of deaths in police custody and no one ever, ever convicted. So the point is, what we're doing in Luton now, because we've been part of this J4L campaign just oh, yeah. for Leon okay. here, and the next move, uh, we've, we've, we've successfully campaigned for Leon's law, which should be implemented in full with no discretion, and the next move is that we're setting an up an office and I, 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 I urge everybody to take this route. The, the magistrate's court isn't solely the property of the the CPS and the police. The magistrate's court, you can go and you can lay an information at a magistrate's court. If you nutted me in in the pub, right, I'm entitled to go down to the magistrate's court, lay an information, spell out what happened and who done it with witnesses, and then that magistrate has to issue a summons if there's a prima facie case. If they issue a summons, they interview the, the, the person gets summoned. That doesn't matter whether you're a police officer, the Queen of England, or a geezer on the street. Everybody's entitled to use the magistrate's court for private prosecutions, and that's what's going to happen in Luton from here on in. No one else is going to have any confidence in IPCC or any other acronym they come with. Glenn, were you at the meeting last night? I was at the meeting. In is England. is there a danger? That, um, that that other parties, uh, including Leon for Justice, and, and I'm, I say that hesitatingly, yeah. hesitantly, but other parties, including that, and, and other parties with with just a grudge, not to demean the Leon for Justice campaign, but other parties that have just got a grudge against the police, could uh, potentially hijack this particular story, and uh, 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 in some ways damage the Ali family and their their complaint. Well, I tell you now, I, I, I know the Ali family. I know, I know one of the one of the boys there. One of the, a beautiful family, that right, inoffensive, uh, wonderful family, right. And they were very, very, very pleased at the fact that they're not alone in this, mm. right? That the community in general, campaigners and non-campaigners, are standing by their side with them 150%, right? Because it did descend last night, didn't it, from what I've heard, that people were, were, were taking the mick out of the way Ollie Martin spoke. That, that's not really appropriate, is it? That, that's not going to take the argument any further. No, it's not. It's not. But, you know, what, what, look, look, what that's a symbol of is this, this layer of accountability, so-called, that I'm talking to you about, is held in deep contempt by wise members of the public. They, they don't fall for it anymore. But mocking right? the way someone speaks, that's, no, no, that's no, no, not no, great, no, is it? No, wasn't mocking the way he speaks. It was mocking what he said. And what I said to Ollie after, I said to Ollie, you know, there's nothing personal in this, Ollie, right? What it is, is they've put in a layer of protection for the police, and all of a sudden, instead of Nigel having to take the questions, the assistant chief constable, Ollie's taking questions, and he's saying, you can vote for me in two and a half years. Well, how many people are going to be beating the cells between now and then? And also... He had to accept when I said to him, do you think those officers should be suspended? And he ummed and ahed and couldn't. That's what people were laughing at, because he couldn't answer, because he hasn't got the power to suspend them. Glenn, do you think Ollie Martin should stand down? No, I don't. No, I don't. I don't think... I think that's a weapon of mass distraction, right? He didn't beat up Farouk Ali, right? He, I think those coppers who beat up Farouk Ali, the ones who did whatever's happened to Leon, and we still don't know what's happened to Leon, and this is a disgrace of it, as you said, right? Ollie has no power to make those police suspended. He has no power to say that they should be interviewed straight away. All he does is gets paid to come and try and justify that. Glenn, we've got to end it there, just because uh, I, I, I want to squeeze in Pete and Milton Keynes. Morning, Pete, what would you like to say? 
Good morning. Yeah, I'm, I've worked with all Sesame Street, but I'm, well, I can't understand it. Pete, it's a terrible line. We'll try and get you. I, I, it's an interesting point you want to make. I, I think the point you wanted to say was why wasn't Farouk supervised? Uh, it's a terrible line. He was at the end of his front garden. He was at the end of the front garden looking at the bins. D- d- does he need to be supervised in that instance? And you would you would hope that uh, that an autistic person could be out and about unsupervised and not get assaulted by the police, which is what is alleged by the Fruit family. Uh, a, t- a text and an email. OC says, uh, it's a good job the police aren't run by radio journalists jumping to conclusions before an investigation has been properly started, let alone completed. And Anne in St Albers uh, on the email says, tried and judged by Ian Lee, why not wait for the truth to emerge first? Well, that's what we're trying to find out. And, and th- there are some people who are worried that I- if spotlights are not shown uh, shown onto these dark corners, then these things might never be properly investigated. So that's why we're doing it. It wasn't a trial, it wasn't a judgment. I was asking questions, asking questions. That I think uh, we as taxpayers, we as uh, citizens, we as human beings have the right to ask of the police and of the police and crime commissioners, particularly when allegations of a vulnerable man being uh, uh, assaulted by the police have b- risen to the surface. We need to ask these questions, don't we? And we can't live in a, in a world where, you know, th- these things go on unchecked. But thank you for your email, Anne, and your text, OC. Right, let's have a look at some of these uh, texts. We're talking about Farouk Ali, uh, the uh, autistic gentleman, mental age of a five-year-old, who's out looking at the bins. He likes watching the bin men. Who doesn't like watching the bin men? My boys love watching the bin men. Uh, and it's alleged by his family he was assaulted by two police officers. Uh, we spoke to Ollie Martins and uh, also Jim Saunders, Chief Superintendent. Let's look at some of these texts before we go to the phones. Uh, the police have reports against them all the time and a lot of times unjustly. It goes against them straight away and is held on their records until looked into. This can be months or years. This is also wrong and must undermine all police officers. There are two sides to every story. Thank you, Debbie. Uh, Steve says, did Ollie Martin say 50% of all their investigations involve vulnerable people, yet they do not appear to be handling this one well? Hmm. And uh, Jack from bed says, clearly the rules are different for them. If I got arrested for that, they would let me walk. Would they let me walk around for weeks without being interviewed? Don't think so. Suspend them. John's in Milton Keynes. Morning, John. Oh, good morning. Uh, yeah, uh, j- just a, a brief comment uh, cool. about uh, the uh, gentleman who rang in uh, previously. Uh, um, he, w- he wasn't too happy with the way you were conducting uh, interviews. Oh, the, uh, yes, was that the text? We had a text, um, a couple of texts, saying, oh. um, the, the trial and judge by Ian Lee, why not wait for the truth to emerge first? And also, it's a good job the police aren't run by radio journalists jumping to conclusions before an investigation has been properly started. That's, that's the point I, I want to make. Go on. Thank God there's someone like you who can ask serious, serious questions and... I don't think, I listened to both interviews, and I don't think you had good answers to uh, any uh, uh, any question uh, you asked. And that's with regard to uh, Ollie Martin and uh, the uh, police officer. What do you think, John? Do you think that the officers should have been suspended? Sorry, do I think that? That the officers should have been suspended? Uh... Oh, it's a difficult one. Isn't it? Yeah, it is difficult. And you asked that question uh, to, uh, to to uh, uh, both parties. Yeah. Um, quite honestly, Ian, at the end of the day, I'm not quite sure. I am not quite sure. But the way you conducted the uh, two interviews... I personally thought was excellent. John, you're very, very kind. Thank you very much indeed. And it's a tough one. Of course it's a tough one. We don't know the police officer's side of the story. Apparently their account was very different. But when Bedfordshire police are under the microscope, as they are at the moment, don't they have to be seen to be doing something very, very quickly to allay fears? Matt Lockwood, uh, my colleague here, was at the meeting last night. He came in this morning. Didn't Matt look concerned this morning? Yeah, he kind of had a furrowed brow. He said it got very tense last night. And there are tensions, and I'm not saying that to encourage them or incite anything at all. I'm saying that to report what, uh, what people are saying. There are tensions. There are tensions directed towards the police, and they need to act quickly, don't they? 
Oh eight four five nine four double five five double five. Sally's on the line. Morning, Sally. Good morning. What would you like to say? No, I was just say I was listening to the program today, and I think that the police really need to like take the shot. Sally, could you turn your radio off? Sorry. That's, that's okay. It just it sounds like you're in Wembley Stadium, and it, uh, I'm oh, sure. I apologise. That's all right. Go on. Look, where you go? Yeah. Um, they need to take into account the the deeper impact that it has on the community because. Um, I don't know if you remember, you reported on the Hertfordshire police with the girls with the smashed window and stuff like that. OK, yeah, we, we have to tread very carefully around that case yeah, just no, because no, it's no, going to fine. court today, but yes. Yeah, no, that's absolutely fine. Um, my son was actually off school that day and he was quite upset about what he had heard. Yeah. Um, and then the, after school that day, I went to pick up my other children and um, we saw a police officer. I always encourage my children to talk to the police. Oh, yeah, so do um, I, yeah. Yeah, and um, we said hello, hello, Mr. Police Officer. And the police officer looked at me and said, and who are you? That's what the police officer said. He didn't acknowledge me and he didn't really acknowledge my son. He, that's all he said. It really upset my son. Um, and my son then thought that the police were were racist because of what he had heard. I then said to him, no, the police are not racist, blah, 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 blah. But hang on, when the police said, and who are you? What, 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 that, that sounds like a, a quite innocent thing to say. No, no, it, he said, and who are you? That's oh. what he said. Oh, OK, yeah. that's disappointing. Yeah, it was. It upset my son. I, I in the end, I said, I said, oh, I, I'm just a mother at the school, and he was like, yeah, and who are you? And I, I told him my name. But um, anyway, and then you have the incident with Leon Briggs, and then you have the incident with Mr. Ali. Um, I think you just have to. They need to look at the deeper effect that it has on the children. Sally, you're, you're absolutely right. And I, I have to say, I have to say that most of my incidents, my encounters with the police have been brilliant. And whenever we see coppers, when I'm with the boys, we always make a point of walking past, at the very least waving to them. Generally, we go and say hello. And if they've got motorbikes, we definitely go and say hello. And uh, I cannot think of an instant when the police have been funny in that situation they've always they've always let us look at the um the, the motorbikes i think once they are they invited my boy into the police car but he got scared <laughs> yeah, they know that they're public figures and yep. they're instantly recognizable i've got a number of friends who are police officers and they are doing it because they really really want to make a positive difference yeah i was saying that i took the boys to windsor castle uh, the other day since them to windsor castle okay. lot of armed isn't it odd you get armed police guarding the army that's a weird thing, yeah. but the, the, uh, don't don't joke with the, the don't joke with those guys who got machine guns outside the Winter Castle. No, they're not playing games. They they have not got the lightest souls. A soldier there terrified my two year old Winter Castle. Why? He was doing the sentry box thing, yeah. and a, a tourist got a bit too close, and he did that thing where they sort of swing their guns around a bit and yep. stamp. Yeah. She swore and bolted. Yeah. And Your daughter? Like, no, the, oh, the tourist. Yeah. My daughter was terrified because they were watching a sedate scene. All of a sudden, it kicked off. Well, I tell you my what, two-year-old was terrified. I tell you what, terrified. We saw the same thing once, right? But it went a little bit further, uh, and this terrified me. I, even I was like, <laughs> so someone sort of went too close to the photo, and the guy went, "Stand away from me now!" Yeah. <laughs> we okay. This soldier did the drill and then said, "Don't swear," which was <laughs> kind of broke the tension a little bit. But um, my uh, little one was already gone. Imagine that you're looking at a stationary sh- soldier. Someone gets too close. Stand away from me now! Oh man, Max is in Hitchin. Morning, Max. Morning. Max, How what, you doing? Yeah, I'm fine, thanks. What would you like to say? Um, yeah, I, I was just with regards to the uh, the incident that's happened. Yes. Um, it just seems almost like it's a cover up attempt by the police in, in the respect that they were hoping it was going to go away. It, it seems they've taken you know the incident was reported as happening um, two months ago. Well, it was no two weeks. ago. The twentieth of February. This this incident happened. Ah, right. So okay. But but the, the investigation start. The, the, the officers didn't report it for a few hours. Their the um, their notebooks. They they gave their notes from their notebooks. But two weeks in, they've still not been interviewed as part of the investigation. Yeah. I, I can certainly understand that in respect that they want to gather the correct evidence. But if they haven't taken statements and so forth uh, at this stage, you'd have thought they'd have already had done that before they even progressed any further with the, uh, the incident anyway. Max, can I ask you a question? Yeah. Have you been ever a copper? No. OK, because no. you're, you're speaking I'm... in police speak. <laughs> what's, what's your background? You're talking about incidents, and what's your background? If you don't mind me um, asking. I, I have got friends that are police officers, okay, but right. I've also got friends that um, I, I spoke, 
Backstreet Street. No, no, no. <laughs> no I, I've got um, a, a friend that died in police custody as well. Oh dear, I'm sorry to hear that. So, I'm yeah. sorry to hear that, Max. Well, listen, thank you very much for coming on, and uh, I appreciate your time. Cash is driving to work. Morning, Cash. Yeah, no, good morning, Chief. What would you like to say, boss? Just like to say very quickly, I do listen to show quite commonly, but uh, quite frankly this morning I think this is an absolute disgrace uh, for those two officers, what they've done, and I think they are giving Bedfordshire police a very, very bad name. Well, it, it, again, we have to tread carefully, because it, it, it's alleged what they've done, and, and it, uh, in fairness to the police, we have only got um, uh, Farouk Ali's family's statement. Uh, uh, no, we have a bit more than that. I think we have a bit more than that, honestly. I mean, what uh, do we have? What do we have that's more? So, I mean, they're, they're, they're last night, you know, there were over 200 people outside. That doesn't, pr- that doesn't uh, prove anything. That doesn't prove I that think, they did it. I think, I think it does. I mean, well, I no, Cash, to... Cash, Cash, with the, I wish you'd come on early because we've only got 40 seconds. With the greatest yeah, of respect, uh, uh, 200 people turning up to an event does not, gar- does not mean, is not evidence that the police uh, beat up someone. To be a very quick example before we leave, Bedfordshire police are most probably the most unfriendliest police force. I know, but, but Cash, general, Cash, you're not giving me evidence that the police did it, and that's the thing, we have to wait no, for this. I think, enough, I think I have enough evidence. I mean, well, I've what, give me some evidence. What evidence have you got? Sorry? What it's evidence? Been wit- it's been witnessed by the local people and the residents that actually live in this street. Okay, what but that's... What kind of witnesses and proof do you require than this? Well, I, Cash, I'm... What, I'm about this neck that says autistic, okay. you don't need much more Again, proof. Cash... Cash, we've only got the family side of the story at the moment. And I appreciate, I appreciate what you're saying. We've got to end it there. But 200 people turning up to a meeting is not evidence the police assaulted anybody. You can't say that's, an e- that's evidence. And we have only got... I have only got... I don't know what you've got. I've only got the evidence from uh, Farouk Ali's family and from what we got from Ollie Martins and uh, from Jim Saunders and from uh, Matt Lockwood, who was at the meeting. That's all I've got. That's all I've got to go on. John, I'm really sorry, mate. I haven't got time for you. Try and call in a bit earlier tomorrow. Well done to everybody who claimed they're dead rock stars. Congratulations. Feed them, water them, look after them well. JBS is up next until 6 o'clock tomorrow morning from me. Ta-ta. Local and vocal across beds, hearts and bucks. This is BBC Three Counties Radio. Thanks, Ian.